Today, we're gonna be taking a closer look at whether or not these leaks are going to ruin the announcement of Switch 2. Are leaks good? Are they bad? We live in the age of leaks. And do people care? And do people care? Also. Exactly. The leaks are running rampant. Pioro's mm -hmm. running rampant. <laughs> Nintendo's done a really good job so far of keeping the Switch 2 leaks mostly under wraps. Yeah. But it just feels like we're any second the other shoe could drop right. and we could see what this thing looks like or we could hear about a game or, or mm -hmm. anything could happen. So we're gonna take a closer look at that. Also take a look back at the original Switch and see like when about did the leaks start to happen and maybe try and line these up and see- historical comparison. Whereabouts are we now? Yeah, so we are in the midst of GDC week. That's right. Um, so yeah, these leaks could be That's, it's happening a big, as we speak. It's a big week for uh, loose lips, for people in a bar just saying yes. stuff that they probably shouldn't. So- Yeah. Wait, again, it could happen anytime. It could happen at any time. Right. And we're also going to be joined this episode by WayForward's Tom Hewlett, who is actually somebody that I worked with when yeah. I was at Konami. That's so cool. And we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, Contra, Operation Galuga, but also just their general philosophy overall of like bringing retro franchises into the modern era, because they have right. a really good track record with this. Yes, yes, exactly. And he's just a lovely, a lovely person, so it's nice to catch up with him. Yes. Yeah. Before we go any further, you are a hot mess today. You- I really am. Uh, informed me as you were putting on your microphone. Oh, my shirt's on backwards. Yes. Which maybe Very is an indicator that you're a little bit off today. Yeah, I looked down I, as I was clipping my mic on, I saw the, la the label. I was like, wait, this isn't right. I, I don't know what's happening with you. So I, I'm just telling the good people, it might be one of those episodes, okay? I'm fine I'm just, now. I'm just saying. I'm okay. Right, right. Uh, we have some exciting stuff happening this week because we're in Dragon's Dogma 2. We are. The game. The game. So we are pawns. Yes. Which are kind of these computer controlled characters that you can bring into your game mm -hmm. who kind of like create your party yes. in that game. But we're part of the official uh, Capcom suite pro of program. Uh, program? Yes, whatever you choose to call yes. it. We are the official pawns. We've each created our pawns. Um, we've submitted them to the good people of, of Capcom. That's right. So they should the be- The work is done. In the thing for you guys, the rift um, for you guys to get. Exactly how it works and how you get it. Please refer to the official Capcom exactly. materials because we See may- See how not, I don't know. Because we may not exactly know at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we've we, done our work, we've made them. We had fun making them. The yeah. character creation is really, really cool and very detailed. We had a really good time making our pawns. We also had like the crazy dilemma of like, wait a second, if our pawns look like us, then who, what is our main what is your character, character going to be? Because like? normally you just play. Oh, I'm going to make me. Is that's going to be my main character? Right. But, but we then... realize no. Well, well, I'll have a main character who can have Kit and Krista pawns. Right. So we can't have another Kit. There's only one Kit. There's only me. There's only one Krista. Right. More importantly, you can so, have Bizarro Krista. Yeah, like an upside down. Yeah. Like a. Shirt, shirt backwards, Krista. <laughs> She's just a mess. I'm Again. her now. This is my evil twin. Her hair's messed up. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we basically made like very off the wall, um, beastrin. The cat, main, cat people. Main characters, right. which is kind of cool. It's which not, is not something I would do normally, no. but I kind of like it now. Like I, I made like the, the largest, most buff looking cat person oh, wow. that I possibly could. And I think it's gonna be great. I made mine look like a snow leopard, which was weird, but I kind of like Oh yeah, kind of like the white, the white yeah, with the, with the, the spots. spots. Yeah, I did that yeah. too, actually. Oh, really? But also a big lion's mane. Oh, I have a like, big... I have like a braided Is you gotta show them like, yeah, I'm, 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 a, I'm a real cat King person. No, I'm a real cat person. I'm not King one of those of fake cat people. This is real. Great. Yes. But we have a video of you making your pawn, yes. which was an extensive process, took over an hour yes, to you... do it were smart and did not comment a lot on my There were certain details that I, certain I, details I chose to not comment on. To not get in trouble later. <laughs> to not be me yes, holding a grudge I, on I you know. later. Like, I, remember that time when I was making a paw and you said this nope. to me about me? Well, now I hate you. <laughs> could, be a little, could be a little chubbier. I don't know. Just saying. <laughs> I don't know. Didn't you eat that pie last week? <laughs> What is it? A moment on the lips. <laughs> Lifetime on the hips. <laughs> but at the time that we did that, I was not yet confirmed right. for the program. Right. But I am now. You are. I am you now. You snuck your way in. 
Capcom, they, they tweeted it out at a very strange time. It was, like, bury you. it was like 10.30 at night. I saw that. And the notification just started pouring, and I was like, what's this? Like, oh, okay, I see. You are also announced. And, it was um, like a Japan time thing. I was announced alongside other certain content creators who are maybe more or less notorious for, for certain reasons. I don't know. Oh, oh I don't my. follow these people. Your mentions but I certainly I certainly learned about them as the mentions poured in Your over, the, were over, the, over the weekend. And even even today, they're still coming in. The menchies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that was entertaining. That's fun for you. And uh, and fun. But it's it's nice to to be finally both of us are confirmed. So now you can get the official Kit and Krista pawn in your Dragon's Dogma game will just chatter your ear off. It's just like you listening to a podcast. <laughs> Today, you're going and to again, an adventure. If you would like to throw us off a cliff, you probably can do that. Don't do that. Why That's not? not nice. Do it to her. What? What? Hey. Huh? What? Um, class did you choose? I'm the fighter. Call? Okay, and I'm yes. the archer. So hopefully there. It does create so some good composition That's for, what a, I'm for a party. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So. Hopefully we're helpful to you. If not, feel free to yeet did you, us. Did you tweak your pawn after we did the, the video not here? Not really. No. Okay. Yeah. Because I did I did one session, and then I came back to it the next day, and I did some, some very minor tweaks. Yeah. But You sent me a photo of yours, and yes. I thought it looked pretty good. I think it's good, yeah. I think it's good, yeah. yeah. I think mine is, is okay. The key is the hairstyle. If the game has the hair, either you know, for you or me, like immediately, it's like, okay, yeah. this, is, this is what we I want. I have very normal, like very nondescript hair, though, so it's not really... A but it can it can make or break like the look, you know? That's what true. you're what you're going for there. The main thing that was that made my palm feel like me is the frowny face. <laughs> we decided that that was <laughs> that was the thing that If you want to have really a toothless pawn, you can do that too. That's fine. You can have teeth missing too. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. So that's um, happening. But yes. And as you were saying, it's also GDC week. So right. this is kind of our one day here. Cuz this shows it this, this fits in our backyard. It's in San Francisco. Yeah. So we're going to be out there for mostly the rest of the week uh, doing stuff and meeting people. And it's always a weird show, I feel. Mm -hmm. I'm always like, what is the point like, of this? <laughs> if, you're, if you're not a developer, right? obviously, if you're a developer, yes, go, go crazy. Like, this is your week. But there's a lot of other stuff that happens around us. Does this always need to happen? I don't know. I, sometimes sometimes I, feel, I feel bad for the developers sometimes. That's what I was just going to say. Sometimes I feel like, do they want to just talk in private without all of right. these, Leave these people alone. hangers-ons? Like these people that are trying to do like, quote, marketing? Right. Um, like us. <laughs> like sometimes I'm like, I don't want to bother them. Like they're trying to learn from each other. This is like their little time to, you know, have very good, I think, you know, conversations with other developers to talk about what's cool and not cool. And you kind of don't want to distract them from that. But on the other hand, it's great because now there has been this bit of a, a precedent of, you know, a lot of indie developers come out to show their games. We get a chance to go see them, which is really great. Um, we get a chance to catch up with some of our, like, friends that we don't see, um, you know, all the time. And they're in town for GDC. So we get to catch up with people. And that's always nice. So I kind of feel like two ways about it. But... Yeah, it's 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 easy for us because it's literally here, so we don't have to really. It's go, easy to go, go to. anywhere. Yeah. yeah, for this. Leave Britney alone. Leave the developers alone. That's how I feel. Oh. Uh, even all these years in, I remember when we were at Nintendo, GDC was like a really big deal. Yeah. And like usually, like or, or several times, Mr. Awada would be giving a speech that felt like like a mini. E3? E3 speech. Yeah. And he obviously felt, you know, very strongly about, you know, speaking directly to mm -hmm. developers he was. and right and, and having some, you know, very very important messages that he wanted mm -hmm. to share with them. Yeah. But that was a really different era of yeah. that show. Yeah. It looks like um, Nintendo is still having the Zelda devs come out to do yes. a talk. There's a couple. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a few talks that they're doing. So they, we've done that in the past with Nintendo mm -hmm. like have the devs out to do um, some sort of talk. I, I think the Breath of the Wild one was like legendary, one of the best ones that Nintendo's ever done. But yeah, I'm, I'm we have a whole episode about that, by the way. If, yes, you, if we people do. want to go into the uh, archives and, and find on, that, like, that, very close. That's a very good episode if you yeah, missed that one. Yeah, that was a cool one because I felt like the content was actually like meant for that GDC audience, yeah. but also felt very just like broad for everyone else that wanted to learn yeah. about the the creative behind the game. Um, I do wonder what their angle is going to be this year. You know, this buy this is, game. That's what that's I was just going to say. Like, it feels very marketing versus it being like genuine. Like, I don't know what information is going to be there, but like, 
I can't imagine this is going to be focused on like let's teach people about game development versus buy this game. Well, that's the thing. There's like there's all these panels, and about half of them are very truly developer focused. Yeah. Where like if you and I walked into this, be like, I don't understand a thing of what these people are talking about right. because we're we're not game developers. And then there's the other half that are basically like promotional, like almost commercials yeah. for games. And like the intention is like, oh, hey, press, come cover this and let's get some more coverage and let's go, yeah. let's, let's drum up some more interest for exactly. this game. So that part feels a little odd to me. It, it's, right. kind of, it's kind of what we're talking about where th there's the, the sort of the developer focused part of the show that seems important for developers. And then this other offshoot, which is now becoming more and more part of the developers part of the show which is like all this marketing and all of this promotional stuff that just feels a little bit at odds with what this show and his original intention was supposed to be. Um, but anyways, we'll be there. <laughs> and yeah. Then there's the biz dev people you can spot from a mile away, wheeling and dealing oh, the wheeling in that W bar. Those are the ones. You Sign on the dotted out. line. You gotta watch out for those. Sign on the dotted line. I have seen a lot of people out there on social media like putting out like, if you are pressured by someone in business development, here's what you should do. Oh my gosh. Which I think is good advice. Because you wow. may, I don't know, you may not know. Like you sign this deal. Don't sign well, any well, deals. What, 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 what? I don't know. <laughs> Definitely don't sign any deals at the W Hotel. Yes. So yeah, we have to run into a lot of people. Should be uh, a fun week though. Yeah. All right. We are moments away from getting into our discussion of leaks and the Switch 2. First, we've got to shout out our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by MeUndies. Thank you. We <laughs> and need you. as always, wearing them right now. Oh, wow. Just going to put, just gonna put that out there. Okay. Not backwards, by the way. <laughs> Not backwards. <laughs> Not backwards. So let's talk a little bit about the underwear drawer. It's a mess, Which guys. is a place where anything can happen. Yeah. If you reach deeply into the underwear drawer, you don't know what you're gonna pull out. That's right. It could be like threadbare, it could be holes, oh, it could be like design, like, oh, I, I had this, what? Mm -hmm. I, I, I was into this back then? Okay, yeah. that's that's interesting. But uh, no, the undies has the underwear down. This is some great stuff that we've been wearing and we love. Yeah, it's so comfortable and such high quality as well. We were both so surprised and just pleasantly surprised by what good quality it is. And it has so many different kinds of prints and colors and designs. So yeah, when you reach into that underwear drawer, you're not pulling out something gross. You're pulling out something great, which is a Miundi. That's right. Uh, they have a lot of great prints and patterns uh, that you can match across men and women's uh, designs and styles. They also have loungewear. I like the loungewear. So it's not just about underwear, uh, lounge, lounge in comfort and in style. And like we were saying, the comfort is uh, truly incredible stuff. You just know it when you pick it up. So that's that's a solid piece of underwear right That's there. That's right. I can, I feel, I can appreciate I this. I find myself. As it girds my loins. Oh. Yes. I find myself reaching only for the MeUndies these days, though. It's like all the other underwear can just, just go away. Clear it out once and for all. Only reaching for Goodbye. the MeUndies. Goodbye. <laughs> so, get 20% off your first order plus free shipping at MeUndies.com slash KittenKrista. That's MeUndies.com slash KittenKrista for 20% off plus free shipping. MeUndies, comfort from the outside in. We'll put the link right over here and also in the description below. All right, on to the big discussion mm -hmm. of the leakers ruin the Switch 2 reveal. Yes. And, and do we care? Do we care? We'll get to that. Yeah. I want to start with a bit of history, though, kind of going through this timeline for the original Switch, mm -hmm. because I think this is important yeah. to just, again, understand when is this most likely to ramp up, right. when are leaks most likely to happen? And again, try and match it up to see where we are now with the Switch 2. So back in March 2015, Nintendo announced the NX right. as part of, and, and I think maybe this is a forgotten detail of this. This was part of the announcement of the deal that they did with DNA to get into mobile games. Right, <clears throat> yes. Right, so that was, kind of part and parcel with that deal because people, there was, it, it would have been easy for people to assume. We're oh, getting out of the console Oh, Nintendo's games. getting out of console yes. games. Oh, Nintendo's getting into mobile games exclusively. Okay, right. I get it. So no, that was kind of like the second half of that of like, no, right. we're gonna do both. And we have a new system called the NX that's gonna be coming in a couple years. So 
this is the new path for the company. We're going to be doing a lot of different things that are all very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember this being a huge thing of discussion and that I needed to have the conversation of launching new dedicated hardware needed to happen at the same time as the mobile stuff because, yes, it was so easy for people to freak out, basically, and make, jump to those kinds of conclusions. Right, so, right. Yeah. So that was two years before the system came out. Right. We're certainly closer than two years uh, hope, I, I should hope, hope so. so. For the Switch <laughs> yeah. 2 comes out, there's been no such confirmation, no such announcement. Obviously, the company was in a very different place. Right. You know, you had the we do and basically nothing. You didn't have a lot to lose to come out and say, yeah, we're working on the next thing. It's coming right. in a couple of years. Look forward to it. Uh, so that was March 2015. Then in October 2015, you started to hear rumblings of dev kits going to third parties which, yeah, that would have given them about, you know, a year and a half or so. Um, I imagine there were some that went, you know, well before then. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, you know, when they started to go out widely and you've really started to hear. This is, this is kind of when the rumors really be going. began. Yeah. Right. Um, January, the following year, you started hearing about private meetings with partners at CES. This mm -hmm. mirrors what we were hearing at last, Gamescom last, last summer. Year. Gamescom yes. at CES. The behind closed door <clears throat> meetings. Right, right. Which is nothing unusual. Right. If this is kind of normal business that's going to be happening, I'm sure, at GDC. Yes. With um, you know Nintendo people um, going to that show, there's, a, there's always a, a big contingent. Um, that goes beyond people who are speaking on a stage, right. who are actually talking to developers and, and you know getting updates on games and just doing regular business. So this is you know I, I wouldn't necessarily couch this as a leak per se because there was no information about the system that was getting out, but it was yeah. just kind of like hey things are moving and things ahead. are happening, which right. just indicates like when you know this might come out right. because clearly things are moving forward with third-party developers making games for it. Right, right. So then we can jump ahead to April of 2016. I did not remember this announcement, to be honest, when I was doing my research on this. Mm -hmm. So Nintendo tweeted out in April 2016, the next generation of Nintendo is coming March 2017, hashtag NX. I do remember this. You do remember this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do remember this. All right, over a year in advance. Yes. Or, or about a year. Yeah. Out. It's coming out in March. That's yeah. right. Okay. So at this point, we're, you know, within a year of the release, nothing really tangible or legit. Obviously, there were, you know, speculation, rumors that ended up not being true that was happening. Mm -hmm. But up to this point, up to a year out, pretty tight ship. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. No major leaks, no major slip-ups. Right. But Nintendo was also officially confirming things right. along the way pretty early on. They, obviously, they acknowledged the yeah, existence yeah. of it early they'd on. Had a, they'd had a year of this being a known quantity up to that point. Exactly. So I think that that is something that we should talk about once, once, once we get into the leaks discussion because I think this is making the difference between what is happening then and what is happening now. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so... Then, so, so again, you know, important to note, so that's about a year from when it came out. Right. And if you believe the rumors currently about Switch 2 coming out in March of next year, that's about where we are now. Right. Because after that, things really started to heat up mm -hmm. in terms of leaks and actual legitimate information yes. coming out. So April, or excuse me, May 2016. Oh, this thing. <laughs> there were reports pretty wide, widespread reports that um, the system would use cartridges instead of discs, mm -hmm. which obviously the Wii U used. Of course, that is, that correct. That is correct. Yes. And then also around that time, there was this fake mock-up that really went viral. Yeah. And I remember this going around and having mm -hmm. a good laugh because yes. at this point, we, we obviously we knew what it was. Like, ho, 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 if only you knew. Yeah. But this is a very well-done mock-up. And this was based on one of the patents mm -hmm. that um, got out and obviously, you know, didn't result in any sort of an actual product, but it, 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 it was on people's mind. Yeah. This would have been a terrible way to play a game. Oh my gosh, <laughs> it looks it? awful. But, but yes. I mean, it, it looks realistic and, you know, they've... In a prototype state. The lighting, got the little sticker on it. This yeah. Is confidential property, so... I love it. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think this just... 
kind of caused people's imaginations to run wild. Right. Of what oh, it could be. There are so many different possible implementations mm -hmm. of what this could be. Right. And you know, we have we've seen some mock-ups of the Switch 2. We've used some in our thumbnails. Yes. We kind of know which ones work better than others mm -hmm. in that sense, but we haven't really had a moment like this. No. Where people are like, this is it, this is the thing. It's all just been like, well, I don't know, this is what it could look like. Yeah, Maybe. it's not sort of um, any sort of like, oh yeah, this, this could exist because someone took a rogue photo of it during a developer behind closed right. doors meeting. Right, right. Didn't feel like that. It feels more so like people's imaginations of what a mock right, could look right. like. Right, right. And I think maybe there's less imagination in general yes. because we you know, feel very confident that it's gonna be a continuation of the mm -hmm. Switch form factor and concept. So it's like, yeah, we kind of, we, we, you know, I already have that in my hands. I've had that for seven years. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not as compelled to daydream about this and cook yeah. up a, a fun idea of what it could be. And people are pretty realistic that I think the form factor is gonna stay consistent to right. your current switch. Right, so. right. So the hits kept coming in July 2016. There was a big story from Eurogamer, which is an extremely credible outlet, mm -hmm. claiming that it was going to be a portable with detachable controllers, and they actually had this mock-up here, which uh, is very, obviously very accurate to what um, it ended up being. Yes. So at that point, we are, you know, beyond half a year, it's, it's maybe like nine months or so, I don't know, my math is not good as far as months, but you know, still quite a ways out yeah. from this thing coming out and from the official reveal, and it kind of feels like there's some cracks in the facade of the information being able mm -hmm. to be held in, because shortly after that, in August 2016, we got this other leak from a, quote, anonymous developer. Right. Um, some you know MS Paint style <laughs> mock-up but, here, but but looks but it's pretty. But, you know, very, you know, I think accurate. the big difference they had with this one is they kind of flipped what's on the bottom and what's on the top. Right, right. All that stuff is is actually um, on the top, and what's on the what's on the top is on the bottom. But yeah, this is this is very correct. So and again, across all of this, there was so much speculation and chatter and heat just around you know different hardware concepts, different games that people had heard of, mm -hmm. and most of it was not accurate. Right. I got a lot of this information from a video that Scott the Waz did, which was very comprehensive on the run-up to the Switch launch. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I pulled like, you know, half a dozen milestones and things that were correct, but he had like so many things that people were putting out there that were not correct. Okay. So, so <clears throat> you know, being able to filter what feels like credible information and credible sources mm -hmm. from just nonsense is really is going to be important for everybody over the next year. It's, it's like let's true. not lose our minds over something that you know shows up on a message board from right. from who knows who. Yeah, um, yeah. You have to, you still have to look at the credible sources and the credible you know track record of people that potentially does have. Information that's accurate. Right, right, right. Even if it's leak based. Right, right. So, you know, there was a lot of reporting from credible outlets. Um, and then, kind of, that era's big Nintendo leaker was Emily Rogers. That's right. Who's uh, certainly a name that we were familiar with and uh, spent a good amount of time talking about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was just somebody who over and over again had really reliable information that was yeah. usually correct or if. It, Often, even if it wasn't correct, it was like you're adjacent, in the you're, you're in, the in the ballpark. Right ballpark. You're in the yeah, ballpark. Adjacent here. to correct information. Right, right. And Emily Rogers is not as prominent um, on the scene these days, but it's a good segue into somebody who is. That's Puro. Right, right. Puro so, is probably the premier um, sort of right one stop shop account that people are following now for right. leaks. Yeah, so I did a deep dive into Puro's history just to get a better feel for, you know, when did they come onto the scene mm -hmm. and, and what's their hit rate? Because it, it certainly felt like it was really high. So Puro started in 2022 and interestingly actually started posting about some things that were not Nintendo, uh -huh. which I thought was interesting because it's like, okay, we know Puro now as a Nintendo leaker, yeah, but they, but that's not where they, they had started. some other sources 
prior to that. That we're getting information on other things prior to that. Yeah. Um, the thing Pura would often hint at is my uncle works at YouTube and my uncle can see what the videos are uploaded yes. into Nintendo's account. Mm -hmm. um, which, yeah, that, that could be a way to get some information um, if you can. I think some of the information that Puro has been getting goes beyond that. That's true. Yeah. I think, you know, again, just based on how things work, that, you know, th things are not always uploaded weeks and weeks It's not. In advance. Especially at Nintendo. Right. And because they are trying very hard to be careful and combat leaks, they, they actually right. don't do that. Right, so, right. So yeah. so there, I think there's, there's, more, there's more to Puro than just... That seems like a red than herring. Ju than just that. Feel, hey, feels oh. a bit like a red herring. True. Oh, that's a good point. That's an interesting like point. Like he is trying to get people off the scent of where he's actually getting the information from. Right, right, right. The first big Pura leak was Everybody 1-2 Switch, May 2023. Uh -huh. Called that absolutely right. The way Pura does it's very like... Kind of like, can you guess this thing? Yeah. I, I yeah. think this little, this thing might happen. Do you know what it is? Tongue and cheekish. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right. But really blew up with the June 2023 Nintendo Direct calling Mario Wonder and Mario RPG. And I think from that point on, everybody's yeah. like, okay. He's this, pretty crap. Cr it's pure character. We got to yeah. pay attention to what they have to say going forward. Uh, the September Direct called Mario vs. Donkey Kong F099, another code recollection. That's a very good hit right there. Mm -hmm. November Indie Showcase called Outer Wilds. And then just this February Partner Showcase that we had called Endless Ocean, Pocket Card Jockey, Super Monkey Ball, and Pentiment. Wow. That's a lot of stuff. And mm -hmm. then most recently for Mario Day called that we would get release dates for Paper Mario and Luigi's yeah. Mansion. That one was pretty, so, yeah, Bryce spot on. Basically a more or less perfect hit rate. Yeah, it's so funny too because we we always discuss like whether or not we should put Puro in our news section for yeah. this podcast and talk about this as if it was news. And it's interesting that, you know, we we cover Puro as news now because his hit rate is so high. Mm -hmm. And it's like until this person makes a mistake, until there is some sort of flub, you kind of have to take it at face value, yeah. which is what happens when these leakers become really prolific, and that's when you know I think it becomes like pretty dangerous for Nintendo in terms of trying to maintain that element of surprise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is kind of this new element <clears throat> that Nintendo has to deal with. Yeah. Of we're trying to carefully plan for what they want to be a huge announcement for the Switch to, and yet you have Puro who is out there who through some means is getting information. You've asked me, is Puro work at Nintendo? I'm not I'm not ruling that out. <laughs> I'm not ruling that out in the very yeah, I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't think there, you can. There is I don't think you can. a personality type at Nintendo that work inside the company that I could see doing something like Thinking this. they are doing good. This is like a Robin Hood I situation. I was just gonna say, it was like a, it's a, exactly like a visual anti Robin Hood kind of mentality. Right. There are people that work inside Nintendo that have this mentality and so, they might even think like, look at all this cool, you know, great press and all this conversation I'm generating for Nintendo by doing this good work. Um, and they could think that they're helping the company. And maybe they are. You know, we're, we're not, we have to there's, have that I mean, there's no right? way to actually quantify. I mean, you can feel one way or another. There's no way to actually quantify, quantify it. it. Exactly. Exactly. Right. But so. I mean, well, you know, does Puro work at Nintendo or, you know, either way, Puro is getting information mm -hmm. from some source at Nintendo. Exactly. So there's some, that's the thing. It's like you can remove Puro from the equation, but you may still have somebody on the inside who wants to share yeah. the information, he in could, which case another Puro can pop up right. tomorrow. Puro it might just be the mouthpiece, right. you know, just the account. You're treating symptoms. Not the disease. Right. Exactly. So... Yeah, there we have a PhD, be. by the way. That's a that's a that's a doctor of gaming. That's what we have. <laughs> so we know we know exactly. about this stuff. The professor of gaming. Right. Gaming is here. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but yeah, exactly. So there could be somebody that is just going to continue to 
feed some other person yeah. the information because they, again, they have this mentality that like, no, what I'm doing is actually good and yeah. beneficial for <laughs> Nintendo. Right, so. but it, I think it's notable the information and the games that they have access to, you know, seem to be, you know, in some cases they are third party games. It's not strictly first party. You know, those are things that are often in directs. Mm -hmm. So I think that some of that information is the conduit through which, you know, things are getting shared. But I think if, you know, again, if you were trying to really like hone in on like, okay, who, how could this be happening and who could this be? Like yeah. you really need to analyze like what, what, what is the information they've information? shared and like what could the sources yeah. of that be? So again, it's like a race against time. Of, yeah. You know, can this be dealt with before our announcement and before it gets, um, you know, put out there before we mm -hmm. want to? You can make a movie out of this. This could be an exciting movie. It could movie. be an exciting documentary. Netflix. No, forget a documentary. Pick this no, up. No, let's, let's get, you know, Ben Affleck as the head ninja. <laughs> and he's like in a race against time. The clock's ticking. <laughs> Keep me pure! <laughs> He's got like a, got some like canine unit in the back of his car. You gotta release the hounds. Oh, I like this. Gonna go it's get Puro. Who's gonna be you just see a, a shadowy figure. Who's gonna be cast as Puro? I like the guy who played Mr. Robot in the latest um, Batman, the bat, the Batman movie. Who played the Scarecrow? That that little squirrely uh, character. Oh, squirrely. Pa Paul Dano, I think uh, that's who. Oh, yeah, that's cast him as Puro. Yeah, and he can just he can just get away in the nick of time, go yeah, like underground, underground or something. He's got like a secret. Yes. Escape hatch. He pushes the book. The bookcase. Right. He like he exactly. Like, he like put take a switch right. game out, and the whole it's room like is. Ben Affleck hasn't slept in seventy two hours. He's just like <laughs> crunching crunching tweets. Why is it Ben Affleck? Who's Puro? Who's being cast as Doug Bowser? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, Bruce Willis. <laughs> oh, Bruce Willis. Forever, okay. forever. Forever, yes. Bruce Willis. Forever, Bruce Willis. Okay, okay. Yes. So we're making the movie. Um, right. So but, yeah, Nintendo is definitely incentivized though to try to control ur this. urgently. Take, Stem take care of this. the bleeding. Yes. Right. So what? So, you know, I think Nintendo puts a lot of effort into preventing leaks and seeking out leaks when they happen and stopping those. Right. But do they have complete control over this? Obviously not. No. Because it's still happening. Right. So right. obviously they're they they might be trying, but they're honestly not not able to figure out what is happening. Right. Because this is continued to happen. Yeah. I mean, you can you can drill into your employees that like leaks are unacceptable, this is zero and tolerance, they do. and they do. But at they a do certain- They scare the daylights out of you. At a certain point, working on a new console, like there, you introduce new points of risk mm -hmm. where leaks can happen. Right, Nintendo is obviously a very careful company in terms of controlling information. A lot of the times like, you know, it would be a very small group of people that know certain things. It was very much a need to know basis. Like the the people that know what's in a Nintendo Direct is a very small number of people. Obviously, once you are you know closer to the announcement timing, more more people need to know the information to do their jobs. But even that is very tightly controlled. So I I can you know only imagine the kinds of additional like processes that have been put in place to try to either find out more information about who potentially could be leaking stuff yeah or you know even you know putting more pressure on teams to do the work with less people knowing which is very di difficult for them right i mean you can put the screws on your own employees as much as you want yeah and turn that pressure up to 11 but again if you're just sending out dev kits you know, again, in a normal fashion yes. for games to get made, then you're having exponential risk mm -hmm. that you really can't control. You right. can tell them, you can wag your finger at them, don't leak, don't do don't it. Don't you do it. Don't do it. And of course, people are people that are working with Nintendo, the developers that are working with Nintendo, they, they do have a high level of respect for yeah. Nintendo's rules right. and, and policies. They want to maintain, they're incentivized to maintain positive relationships with Nintendo. They're, they want to have this kind of trust-based um, relationship. So I don't think like it's like, you know, you're just like throwing these dev kits out there into the wild and who knows what these people are going to do. You do Yeah, they'll, they'll definitely evaluate, you know, yeah. does this developer need this at this time? Like right. what are they actually making? Can, they, course, can they wait? Yeah, but of course, the more things that get out there in your normal course of launching a new console, 
the more chance that there is for information to be put out before you're ready right. to be put out. So. And then also, once you have a physical item that you start to manufacture, right. then there's all sorts of other things. One In, in the, the video from Scott the Waz, like he had this, this um, potential leak from Foxconn where it was kind of like jotted onto a napkin, mm -hmm. like this hand-drawn thing. And part of it was right, but part of it was very wrong. Mm -hmm. But that definitely, and I mean, you see this with iPhones now all yeah. the time. Like when these things go into manufacturing, like they always leak. And well, someone's gonna have like a manufacturing document somewhere, like right? And then there's materials. That's the normal course of business. Right, right, right. So you're gonna have to have some materials that point to what something looks like or is, or what components are in it. Right. That potentially could. could get out there, right? right? That's right, just right. the fact of the matter. Right, so that's just kind of, you know, a reality of life is, you know, the closer you get to a potential announcement, the, the risk of a leak is gonna get higher and higher. Mm -hmm. And then you really just kind of need to hope that you skate through yeah. without something um, coming out. But these days it's just harder and harder. Right. It, there's just not a lot that doesn't leak. Yeah, and, and, and it's so hard to control these days because we have this wonderful thing called social media. And if one person posts, posts something, if one person leaks something, the amount of time that it takes for information to spread is mere seconds. And right. then you can never get it back, whether it's true or not true. It's out there. Yeah. And whether you're trying to walk it back because it's untrue or you're trying to stem it because you're not ready to talk about that feature or, or that thing yet, like, too bad. You know, so yeah, it, it's it's really interesting to me that look, especially looking back at the history of what happened with Switch, codename NX, um, and Nintendo's different approach of at least acknowledging the existence of this thing, acknowledging very just general things like, hey, we're, we got a new thing coming in March um, of this year. I feel like that actually helps a lot to get people to just like chill out a little bit. I think this <clears throat> pent up. Yeah, you've given them something. Yeah, this this sort of pent up um, non-information or not non-official information yeah. causes more of this kind of churn with leaks and with even with like misinformation or just everybody's just very like on edge and and really just like digging around for any nugget of information because Nintendo hasn't officially confirmed anything. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I think people are annoyed at is like, obviously there's a new thing coming. Yeah. There's obviously a new system on the way. Yeah. Like, why won't they just tell us? You right, know, like right, it's right. one of those things where you're like, why, why does it matter so much? Um, what are you waiting for? Because we all kind of know, you're just confirming what we already know. Um, so I feel like that atmosphere that they've like inadvertently created, whether or not it was like an internal delay that caused a delay in confirming stuff or whatever else that they've convinced themselves is why they're not saying anything it has caused like this really like bad environment really with people just kind of like completely on edge. Yeah. Well, that's where I think two things can be true because there's on one hand it's like, yeah, Furukawa just, just admit it in the financial meeting. Just, just say it. Like, <laughs> stop lying. Stop lying. <laughs> but then on the other hand, like, I do think there's something to, you know, the, 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 the Nintendo way of waiting till the last second. I do think there's something to that because I do think there's some non-trivial number of people who are going to be like, oh, wait, the next system's coming and I'll just wait. I don't need to buy this. Or oh, like, oh, yeah. people are saying it might be backwards compatible. I'm not buying this now. I'll, I'll wait and I'll just you know put my money into that and I'll, I'll play the games on that then. So it's this weird duality mm -hmm. where, again, I think it's important to look at like the broader, you know, community of people who are buying these systems like beyond yeah. us and like there could yeah there could be somebody who's like less in the know who hears like from some employee like oh did you know the the next switch is coming in a couple months and they like oh yeah I, i'm good i don't need this right now but then it's mean it's because, mean because if they buy it now and the mr furukawa hurt your feelings it's like I feel like that's not very nice. Oh, to you the mean consumer. you mean it's, it's it's kind of shady for the consumer. Yeah, right. Because like, what if you I don't care. are? Well, they don't care. <laughs> they don't care. They don't care at all. But I'm just saying, like that that kind of feels like a dirty business practice where you're like trying to squeeze, especially because you the Switch has enjoyed such a great life cycle with like record breaking sales. Yeah. It's like 
Do you need to be like really greedy and squeeze even more out of these things, or can we just move on? Um, because it it does kind of suck. Like, what if you are not the most like plugged in person, like, right? Not you and me or yeah. our community yeah, yeah, yeah. that knows all the information, and someone buy a switch you, the day before this gets announced. That would be so <laughs> sad. And you like, what if it's like you know you saved up yeah. all your money and stuff like that to I, buy? I, I it? did buy a Dreamcast about a month before they pulled the that plug. Hurts, on that hurts, man. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to be that person. Right. So I would want to know all that information, and like, so I can make the right decision. You know. And it's not a cheap thing. It's not like $2. Right. Like, you know, it's a significant amount of money that some people are saving up for. And this is like their one shot every like 10 years to get something cool. Like that would suck. Yeah. You know? So anyways, I I do feel like this this interesting thing that's happening right now where there's just zero official acknowledgement at all. I remember that the E3... um, which was literally a week before we announced the 3DS XL. Like, we got questions about that. Oh, yeah. Like, so you working on some other form factors? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> and then literally a week later, I had to work on that Nintendo Direct. Like, wait, we're doing what? <laughs> we're, we are announcing it? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, no, we did. We had to say, like, we had to lie and say no. <laughs> nothing happening. No, nothing nothing in announce. the works. Why would you ever ask about that, you big dummy? <laughs> That's when you like have an entire section on um, in the Q and A, and you just copy and paste the response. We have nothing to announce. Yeah. We have nothing to announce. We have nothing to announce. We have nothing to announce. Just all the way across the board for like the next one hundred. Oh customers. my gosh! So so, your your suggestion is having some small information helps the situation. I think so. Of taking the pressure off, taking the heat off. Yeah. So then, would Nintendo again try to get ahead in the in the in the short term, the coming months from now, and just say, yeah, 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 it's coming. Maybe give a general window. Got a lot of great games coming for this year, though. See, I think that would be good. Yeah. I would, if I was still there, I would I would be raising my hand, be like, hey, guys, have we considered yeah. this? I don't think that's what they're going to do. I agree. I think... I think they are very focused, to your point, about just squeezing the last... Yes. That sponge is all. Sorry, I'm making the. I'm doing the one-two switch. You're doing the cow milking. We're doing the cow milking. They've they've Please learned. Please stop. They've cow milked the last juicy drops out of that switch, the original switch. But they they are they really want to squeeze. Yeah. As much as possible out of the. Yeah, thing. they're they're gonna ride it until there's nothing left. Until like they're they're beyond the e sign on the you know <laughs> the, the gas thing in the car. Because I think they do see, like, yeah, this is the golden goose. This is going to end up being maybe the best-selling console ever. Like, yeah. we have to extract every bit of financial opportunity we can yes. out of that they, they before we like before that. we start to talk about the next thing. And that could blow up in their face because that this could, thing could leak tomorrow. That could blow up in their face. And it also points to another concerning, not maybe not concerning, but another thing that is growing to be more and more obvious every day that passes without any information is that this next thing is not going to be some revolutionary thing. Right. Like that's what, what else, that their behavior right now with the need to squeeze so much and be so quiet on this and to not acknowledge this at all, even though there are so many reputable sources talking about exactly what's happening right now, just points to the fact that they... They truly believe that Switch was the greatest console that they'll probably ever launch ever. Mm-hmm. And then the next thing is going to be cool, but it's not going to be revolutionary and not going to yeah. change like everyone's lives and the company's futures, um, fortunes like Switch did. So that's just something to like, let's just wrap our heads around this reality because we just might be that, just set our expectations because that's what it's going to be. You know, that's what it's going to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. So... Let's wrap up with this question. What would a leak actually be the end of the world? No. I think in this case it's important to talk like there's a wide range of what a leak could be. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, launch timing, like stuff that that stuff we've already been hearing about, yeah. like form factor. Uh, I think seeing seeing it the thing. Like a photo of it would be is that's different. Yeah. I think you know, we haven't really talked about games mm-hmm. yet. I think that also maybe is something that people hold a bit more Close to the emotion chest. toward yeah. of how What's those the are seeing those for the first time, how those are revealed. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the feeling I get 
you know, a lot of the time with the hardware is like, yeah, just tell me, just tell me, give me, give me, give me the goods. Whereas with the game, it's like, I don't really want to know about it until I see it in the direct. I want to see the mm -hmm. proper trailer. I want to see it in its best light. Yeah. I don't want to get, so I, I do feel like there's a bit of a gradation there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I don't feel like that at all anymore. Like, I feel like, I don't know. Like, I, I'm not putting a lot of stock in something that will truly surprise me. I think in the age that we live in, it's just, like, unavoidable to have these kinds of leaks. And you can choose to, you know, believe it or not believe it or look at it or not, but... I think it's okay. Like, it's not going to ruin my experience. Like, if, if I knew, like, Mario Kart 9 was coming somehow because of a leak, and then I saw, like, the official Mario Kart 9 trailer in a direct or something like that confirming it, I think I'd still like it. Yeah. I think it'd still be cool. I think right. I would still be happy. I don't think it would, like, like lessen my, you know, emotional, like, excitement or uh, response. Right. Like, any, any well, that, way. That's where it gets hard to talk about this because... Like even if you are invested in that first moment of seeing it, it's like, okay, if you're Nintendo, what is the impact to you? Right. If this thing leaks, probably not a financial impact. No. If it's cool, then people will still buy it. Right. You, I mean, you want the game to be shown in the best light. You will still have that opportunity. Yeah, because you're the one that holds the official assets, and you yes. will be able to show that when you feel ready to show it. Right. Yeah. Right. So. It's, it's, it's a hard thing to talk about because there is an impact, but it's hard to say what exactly the impact is, and yet Nintendo pours so much resources exactly. into stopping this thing from happening like it is the end of the world. It is, yeah. To them, it is the end of the world because they very much want to control the way that you receive that information. We actually joked around about this a little bit. Like, you know, Nintendo wants you to love something that the way they want you to love it. Yeah. They don't want you to love it your own way, though. You know, that's unacceptable. So I think these kinds of leaks and these kinds of situations, even if it does result in you being as excited and as much willing to hand over your credit card to Nintendo, like, they don't care because they, because you didn't get the information the way that they designed for you to get it, which can result in you not specifically loving that thing the way that they want you to love it. Yeah. Um, and that is something that they have to, like, kind of grapple with. This is, like, a thing that they have to deal with because I don't think the situation around the way people are leaking information or even getting information is going to change. I think it's just going to be worse, if anything. Yeah. Um, so they may need to shift their mindset a little bit around, you know, how to handle this kind of situation in the future. Or else they're just going to spin themselves into, like, a craze, you yeah. know, and, 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 yeah, waste a lot of resources. Yeah, yeah I'm like you, too. Like, when, when something leaks these days, I'm like, huh, that's interesting. And sort of, you know, do the analysis of is it is it real? But I, mm -hmm. I don't really feel like, oh, I wanted to learn about this properly. Yeah. It's like I'm 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 good either way. Yeah. You know, the, over the years, the 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 things that I have seen where I do feel bad is like the developer impact, where it's like the developers toiled for years yes. to make this thing. Absolutely. And they have a vested interest in how it gets shown, kind of paying off their hard work. Mm -hmm. Like you really have seen a lot of examples of things leaking the developer being crushed. Yeah. I feel that. I feel that too. I feel for that in a big way. They're really like, and, they're waiting for that moment to have the big payoff to right. all of the, the sacrifices that they've made. Right. And when they feel like they are kind of like, don't get that, like that, that does kind of hurt. Yeah, so you know, know, you know in, at Nintendo, the developers definitely rule the roost. So I think there's some aspect of we're managing them. Yeah, as well, and, oh, of and you course. know, we're we're keeping them in a happy place, that. and no. and yeah. You know. So that's why it's like, I think we feel that way, but we're also our mindset is not also well, we'll leak everything. Who cares? Just just no, let uh, everything yeah, yeah. leak. No, no, not like that. Yeah. I think I think yeah. There's definitely you know, as a company, as a brand, you have to come up with the right strategy for your business to make sure that you are showing your stuff in the best way, and there is a reason for why you're you're doing things on on a certain timing and that's fine for you to decide that if, to decide that strategy but i think nintendo in, in particular we because we've been there we've know we've seen the way that they just kind of work themselves into knots around these leaks um even on the dev side the devs are amazing but they they can be incredibly like sensitive to very small things too like yeah. things that you know like for example like spo story spoilers which is not even a leak really but like that can get them all wound up you know sure i'm just saying like in this age of 
information being shared in such different ways and people experiencing things in such different ways and how quickly things can spread. Like, you may need to just think about how you're reacting to these things a little bit more or else it's going to drive you crazy. You know, it's going to, you're going to drive yourself insane trying to control something that just can't be controlled anymore. I'm still waiting for the company to come out and zag and big brain us all and be like, we're pro leaks. You want to leak something? Go ahead. We don't care. We, 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 we are, we are pro leak. Leak it all. Yeah. 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 <laughs> because again, like, what is the impact? Mm, I don't know. More news. Is and uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, if, if, you're, not the, if yeah. you're not the biggest uh, dog on the block, who knows? Maybe in some way, maybe somehow it could help you. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Is, people are learning about your stuff in all different ways. That could be an interesting Right. Way to People are galaxy braining different things every day. When are we going to arrive at that? I don't know. <laughs> Roll leaf. <laughs> kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. All right. We, of course, asked our Patreon subscribers how they felt about this. Of course. With the question of how will you feel a significant information about Switch 2 leaks before Nintendo's big reveal? And this was the rare poll where there was not a runaway winner. I was just going to say that results are All a lot of these closer. were very than, close. Than, than our normal other polls. Yeah. 31%, which was the most, said, I will be very disappointed. I want to experience the proper reveal by Nintendo. Okay. Okay, 29% said, it depends on how much information gets leaked. That's what we're saying. 21% mm -hmm. says, I don't care. I'll take information however I can get it. There you go. And 19% said, I'm resigned to the fact that a leak is inevitable. Right, right. Now, there is some overlap with all of these options. Yes. So, you know, people could only vote for one thing. So I think there, there are probably times where people are like, well, I actually, ah, I'm kind of two. in between this yeah. or that, or I feel this and that. People couldn't vote that way. But it's very interesting that- How that close. How, how close we are. It's 12% of the difference between the highest and That's lowest. amazing, yeah. Kyle Buff says, in this era, the rumor leak cycle is inescapable. It's understandable for companies to be frustrated in their inability to control the flow of information. For consumers, leaks and rumors have a way of making the discourse interesting and exciting, even if it's in ways that these publishers would rather them not be. Nowadays, it just feels like people want new information as quickly as possible and care little for the actual source. Accurate or not, leaks about Nintendo's plans feel like it has little negative impact on Nintendo's major marketing tent poles like Direct's. It feels like even we know what's coming. Nintendo's announcements are still exciting events in gaming, and leak culture hasn't changed that all. Mm-hmm. Very yeah. well said. Well said. <clears throat> James Powers says, I never believe anything unless it's from Nintendo themselves. Mm -hmm. Everything that's not from Nintendo is just rumors to me until it's confirmed by Nintendo. Yeah. Good that, way to look at it. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. And finally, Daniel Woodward says, I actually really love the speculation that comes from little leaks here and there, even though most of the leaks can be kind of ridiculous. All the speculation for me makes the real reveal and release much more exciting. Okay. Yeah. So then this is like... We are waiting for the actual announcement to confirm whether or not any of these leaks are true or yes. false, and that is exciting. That's fun. Yeah. Okay. I agree. So this is an interesting topic. Uh, again, GDC week is here, so I think you know this is one of those milestones where people are out there talking. People who actually have hardware are going to be out there and talking. Yeah. Some chance that something could come from this, and then like we just showed historically. You know, in that final year, it just kind of escalates as you get a little bit further into it. Yeah. So, something's coming. Something's coming. We don't know what, but it's coming. <laughs> Great conclusion. That's the conclusion. All right. Let's uh, move on to our great little conversation that we recorded ahead of time with Tom Hewlett from Way Forward. So, here we go. So glad to have you on the show. Yeah, we are really excited to talk about Contra Operation Galuga, which is out now, and really kind of dig into this really interesting background on the game and this great collaboration between Konami and yeah. Way Forward. And I think just to get us started, um, you know, can, can you just tell us a little bit about how you came to be in video <clears> game oh development? Um, you want the long version or the short version? <laughs> As long as it takes. Um, <laughs> We're going the full well, story. I, I came to be in video game development because when I was a kid, um, I, I was really good at Battletoads. And this is a true story. And Not everybody and was. Exactly. We had just moved near someone from Virgin Games. And um, they're a European... I mean, the, you know, this is the American branch, but they're a European developer. So their games were really hard, especially at the time. And 
they were trying to prove to their marketing department that, that kids could beat the games because marketing was on their butt. Like, you kids can't... Guys, these games are for kids! Um, and so they found out I could get further in Battletoads than anyone at Virgin, and so he pulled me in to do QA testing on their games because then they could say, well, Tom can finish the game, mm-hmm. so it's fine. Um, and then in high school, I tried to start my own uh, independent game developer, and we were licensed by Nintendo officially, so I was the first Nindy before that was a thing. Wow. Um, wow. Never, we never released our game. And then uh, later on, I worked uh, at Atlas for localization, and I moved to Konami where I was a producer, and now I'm at WayForward as a director. So that's the, the short, long version. <laughs> and you and I have a bit of a history going back to Konami. I believe we had a little bit of overlap. Yeah. Uh, I recall that you and I maybe worked a little bit on another Contra game, Contra yes. 4, for the Nintendo <laughs> DS. Yeah, that was yeah. right. I started, that was before the big migration uh, to the Southern Southern California office. So Exactly. That was one of the last <laughs> games I remember being involved with. Yeah. Yeah. So you left Konami. Uh, yeah, when, yeah. When, the, when the Great Migration <laughs> happened, I, I was not part of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you've had this kind of connection with Contra over, like, you know, such a long period of time. Like, was that, you know, growing up one of, you know, that's a hard game? Was that another hard game that you were just an expert in? I wasn't an expert in it growing up. I actually, when I rented it, I didn't like it the first time I played it. Um, But I I didn't have a friend to play with then. Later later that year, my friend rented it and we played it together and it kind of clicked. But yeah, I always enjoyed it and I played all the Contra games. Uh, Contra 3 was my favorite my super favorite favorite. And then when I came to Konami, um, then me and Simon Lai, who was my co-producer on that, we pi- we both pitched different Contra games one day. And so they assigned us to what became Contra 4. And then we like don't, we played all of them every single day. You know, him and I mastered Contra 1 and da-da-da-da-da. So for the, for the last 17 years, I've been a Contra expert, but that was less from my childhood. Wow. I have a Contra hidden gem that people may not know as much about. I think everybody knows about like the, you know, the classic side scrolling Contras. I really like Neo Contra, which was like the top yeah. down Contra oh, that yeah. was on a PlayStation 2. You don't hear many people talking about that one, but it I was really a lot of fun. That. I mean, it's different than the than the the like traditional Contras, right? But but it was fun. It yeah. was a lot of fun. Yeah. Right. So like you know, Contra had this like really like concentrated history kind of up to the PlayStation 2. And then after that, it feels like the pace of the releases kind of started to slow down a little bit. It had games here and then, but like, I'm curious, like who, who was pushing for a new Contra in 2024? Was it way forward? Was it Konami? Was it, was it, you know, are, are there still people at Konami who have a connection to those classic games i'm just so curious about how this so this so this came to us i mean at way forward we've always talked about like what would we do for another contra because because we'd love to work on it right but this came from konami they you know we'd been talking to them about a couple things and they said hey what would you guys do for a new contra and so we pitched our ideas and they said oh good you want to do an old school one so do we let's do it you're hired um and then they kind of told (laughs) us we're we're kind of rebooting it so story-wise it's a, it's starting from the beginning but it's a new like we want it to be a new game we don't want you to just you know polish the, the original game um and uh I, I don't think there's people from the any of the original teams it's a it's a new team at konami but but they were super supportive it was it was one of the smoothest development experiences i've had um and you know it was a good we had ideas that that they hadn't thought of they had some ideas we wouldn't have thought of and, and we all really communicated really well and hopefully it it was the best possible end result. People will let us know, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, we were just talking about how difficult, you know, some of the original Contra games are, and it is, you know, challenging for people that are not, maybe not (laughs) experienced with this type of gameplay. How do you sort of balance that, um, making a, a brand new Contra game with keeping the sort of the legacy of that challenge, but also bringing in maybe some new players or a new Yeah, so uh, with back in the day with Contra 4, I was like Mr. Difficulty, and and even then Way Forward was like, we should do this. I'm like, no, you can't finish the game on normal, or you have to play on a hard, like that was me. So that's my, I'm sorry, everybody. Um, 
but I had a friend back then that he, he bought, you know, people buy games for their friends to support them. And he, he, he sent me an email. He's like, Hey, I think I need to sell this. Cause I can't, I can't beat it. And like, and like that sat, I was like, Oh shoot. Like my like friend plays music. action games. <laughs> it's too hard for him. And he's sad. And that sucks. So, <laughs> you made so, your friend sad. Oh, no. so when Konami, um, came to us, one thing they said is this has to be accessible to everybody. Like, we're not, we're not saying water it down. Like, we need to find a way that it can be a true Contra, because fans need a true Contra. We want to deliver that. But yeah. people can't be like, this is too hard. I, I can't finish. Like, we want more Contra fans. We want people to see why this is cool and why it's exciting. So I took that to heart, plus, plus my, my dark shame of my friend not finishing Contra 4. <laughs> and um, looked at modern stuff like Elden Ring and well, I guess that wasn't out yet, but from soft games, how they were developing, and and how how to communicate challenge that people would kind of get into and be like, oh, this is fun to overcome. And so, we've added the the game itself is structured. You can kind of choose your difficulty. Um, if you want to play with one hit kills like the old games, you can. If you want to play with a life bar, you can. You're not penalized either way. Um, and then there's perks which you can get and equip again which tailor the experience if you don't like that you lose weapons when you die in contra you get the perk that prevents that if you wish you could start with spread shot there's a perk that does that and that way the player's kind of part of the process it's like what do you want this to be okay we give you some options and now you'll finish the game and then hopefully once you start to get it like oh i'm learning this like i can cycle this game now maybe you take the training wheels off and now you're like posting it online and you're like i'm a contra guy now like i did this so hopefully that works that's the goal is is to not just have like easy and super hard but like give you the continuum mm -hmm. so you can like really learn the genre and then you know play other running guns and get into it what you just said about like really looking at FromSoft games is so interesting because it's like this cycle of difficult games learning from each other. Like yeah. I, I imagine they probably analyze the difficult games exactly. of the past and now you're kind of doing the same thing. Like, can, are you able to share like any more specifics on like what specifically you really gleaned it, from that research? I'll, I'll do this because this is less research. Like we had, we had the plan. We had like, okay, we're going to do perks in our game, um, which is funny because um, Mario Wonder announced that. And I was like, no, that's ours. Like we, that's us. Um, <laughs> uh, but then I felt good about it because I was like, this is this is a thing Nintendo would do. <laughs> this is a good idea. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> good idea so we too, had yeah. our perks. I think we hadn't necessarily established what they'd be yet. I had some ideas. Like obviously you'd have more health points and more lives as options. Um but then when Elden Ring came out and they had like the spirit ash things that it it was like, okay, well you're mm -hmm. not gonna play my friend wouldn't play online multiplayer, but he uses spirit ashes as his like helpers. And then I'd use the spirit ashes and try to recruit the little the other whatever they're called in that game the other helper npc guys um and have a little army to fight bosses with but it was elden ring really had like a how do you want to play this do you want to use spirit ash and then people online like i'm never going to use a spirit ash i'm going to use this other thing and you're like <laughs> well that's that's the same thing it's just a different mechanic like spells are whatever um but that really encouraged me that our design was onto something because it was like okay Elden Ring's doing it. It's having the result we're hoping for. So, like, if you want it, you're using it, and there's no shame in using it, except, you know, some hardcore player is going to yell at you, but who cares? And then, if you're the hardcore player, and your buddies care, then you you still have your bragging rights. You're like, I did this. I didn't die. I, I You know, I beat all the bosses my first try, whatever. Um, And so that really let us lean into it. And then it was also encouraging for Konami when we discuss it. It's so like, okay, well, like, we have proof this plan is going to work. We just need to balance it and tweak it and stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a really positive experience. And uh, and then again, then Mario did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this idea of like player's choice is so important these, these days. You know, people want to kind of experience games their own way. And if you have like a desire to just be super hardcore <laughs> and not use any help and do it that way, great, yep. good for you. But an option for somebody else is always nice as well. No, yeah. I was really surprised um, when I started playing the game. And at that point, I I wasn't totally clear on like, how much is this? 
kind of a straight, you know, retelling of the original game versus a reinterpretation. And I started the first level. I was like, all right, this, this feels pretty true to the first <laughs> level. And then I got to the boss, the, you know, the wall. And then it completely changed and it kind of went right into, I think, the level after that corridor level where you're going up the waterfall. Like, how was that conversation with Konami of like, okay, here's where we're drawing the line of like, here's the stuff that we don't have to do. And here's the stuff we absolutely do have to do. Yeah, they, it's, it's hard. It's, this was so much from the beginning that we both understood that it's hard to remember how it was established, but I'm pretty sure they were, they were saying like, they kept saying like, it's not, you're not doing a remake. Like it's, um, my comparison would be for DuckTales Remastered, which is a way forward game. It was like, you could put the levels up next to each other. And, and the appreciation was like, look, we took this old Capcom level and we like painted it up and look how nice and cool it is. And like for, for Contra, it was, it was not going to be that. It was like, well, there's got to be a jungle. You got to start in the jungle. Cause it's the first game they start in the jungle. But, like, don't make the same jungle. Like, don't. And so we just knew not to do it. So there was never, like, a how similar is this? It was just, this is, I don't know. We, we, we had discussions, and we all knew what the jungle was. But what was interesting was, you know, they said, you can reference, you know, anything from the Contras you want. Um, but this is a retelling of, like, the 8-bit games. So don't have a don't pull in mm -hmm. stuff from this like later games because we might want to use them later if we continue this this rebooted story. We want to have room for that. Um, and so I was being really strict with that. I was like nothing from the sixteen bit games, um, like spiritually concepts from the sixteen bit, but not don't use anything from the sixteen bit games. And then um, famously, the like the mascot of Alien Wars is the robot Big Fuzz, um, the big blue robot, and we'd kind of pitched our bosses and Konami was like, well, where's Big Fuzz? And I was like, well, what, what do you mean? He's from the 60-bit games. And like, yeah, but he's the mascot. He's, you have to have Big Fuzz. <laughs> and so then I was like, oh, okay. So if we have to have Big Fuzz, and then I like, it like rearranged my brain. And so we do have some surprises from later games that I wasn't expecting to do, but it was just kind of a fun, I don't know, that's the fun of game development with a, with a, with a, partner that's working well with you is they'll, they'll give you a surprise where you're like oh wait i'm a fan of this like what does that mean for me <laughs> so <laughs> yeah the um other thing that really surprised me was you know the emphasis on the story and i i never would have considered contra to be like a story heavy series really before then it's like yeah you got these kind of 80s action hero guys and there's these aliens and you're shooting them but like there was a pretty like you know, pretty good establishing story moment uh, up front. Like, w was that like a big, like reach of like, this is a big idea. We want to expand Contra by building it more story. How did you arrive at that? So this is another Konami. One of their goals was, was like I said, to expand the, the reach of the franchise and the appeal of it um, and to reboot it. And, but they really wanted to help establish here. So, the later Contra games, I don't know if you remember the story of Neo Contra, Kit, but it's bonkers. Uh, <laughs> absolute bonkers. And so I think they were also like, okay, this story got a little weird. So let's bring it back to the beginning. Let's give it a new identity that'll be cohesive. It's like, the, the old games also had like a, the story was different in America than it was in Japan. And Europe had the Probotech. It was all very confusing. So it's like, let's get everyone here on the same page at the beginning. And then may maybe we have room to expand it in the future. But that was important to them. So they, they dropped a big, huge story Bible on us um, right at the beginning. And like, so here's, here's the universe. Help us convey this, you know, through however you want. So I just worked on Spider Soars, um, which was another run and gun shooter at Way Forward. It's our original IP. And we'd kind of experimented with story and, and what could we do and how much could we get away with in a run and gun. And, um, also, there were things we didn't have time to do on Spider Source that I thought might be cool. And so it was just a really good time to get this assignment <laughs> and tell them, like, okay, well, here's what people didn't respond to well in Spider Source, but also, what if a little NPC came in and helped you shoot while you were playing and he's helping you and you're playing the game? You're not watching a cutscene. Um, so we got to do some stuff like that, which people can see in the demo. 
um, and then writing the story and learning it because you know this is Konami Japan we're dealing with, and uh, we're in America speaking English. So writing a story together in two different languages was a really interesting process, um, just to learn like what's important for you guys. How does it have to be conveyed to a Japanese audience? But then, but then we're communicating like, okay, but to an English speaking audience, it might need to be this way and a lot of back and forth there. So that was a new, really cool experience too. Nice. Something that I um, sometimes get a little bit sad about is there are these genres that were super popular, you know, in the eighties and nineties <laughs> that you just don't see very much anymore. And like, I think, I think Contra is one of those and like beat em ups is another. And I get the sense that people don't necessarily see the promise of those genres today, but it's something that way forward has been really successful with, you know, you guys have shooters, you did river city girls, which has been a great series for you. Like what is your feeling on those? Like what gives you a different perspective on like, no, we can make this appealing to people today. Um, I, <clears throat> I don't know. That's why I enjoy working away forward though. <laughs> is because we develop those type of games, there's not an argument of like, would this be compelling or like, should you feel like if you're at a bigger company now pitching like the, the Prince of Persia, like you're like, Oh, it's a side scrolling Metroidvania Prince of Persia. Someone's like, what? Like, is that, are people going to like that? Whereas at way forward, it's like, what classic genre is this going to be? They're like, well, it's river city. It's a brawler or whatever. So that you don't have that pushback and it's really then finding, we get to like experiment and figure out what element of modern gaming, like some of the Elden Ring stuff, like what could add to this formula? We know the classic formula. We don't, we don't need help nailing what happened, but how do we evolve it? And so that's kind of an ongoing, like River City Girl. I didn't work on River City Girls, but it, I think that did some really cool stuff in the brawler space that maybe hadn't been considered since the old River City Ransom that it never went beyond like, well, there's shops. It's like, right, but what does that mean? Like, how do we play with that? Um, so yeah, it's an exciting time. And also for the indie space, you have you have indie creators trying to make that name for them. Like, I like this genre, but I'm going to do some crazy new thing with it. And so with companies like Way Forward and then indie developers, there's a good conversation there that I think is modernizing these old genres and hopefully um, people that think they're dated can, can like hook into one and be like, Oh shoot, this is actually like my childhood, but like amped up. Yeah. One of the questions that we get so often <clears throat> from our, you know, listeners and viewers is like, what's going on with Star Fox? And I think that <laughs> kind of falls into yeah. a similar category of, you know, maybe the on-rail shooter is not as hot as it was in the 90s. And Nintendo's tried some things, but I, I wouldn't say they've necessarily like landed on the right formula for that. But again, just hearing about like the lens that you put these projects through and like there are ways to take bits and pieces from other modern games and make them appealing to, you know, whether you played the original or if you're coming into it new, like that that does really give me hope but again i just feel like you're one of the few developers that's actually yeah. doing that yeah. in a big way yeah and that way you're also like sort of keeping those old you know those old franchises that we grew up with alive and new people can experience it or else they just kind of fade away which is really sad um, especially like 90s kids like us that you know we grew up with these games so we don't want to see see them go yep. you know so that's really cool that way forward is sort of um, you know, sees, sees the importance of that and, and is looking for ways to modernize and bring in new audiences. Yeah. So you mentioned to us your favorite Contra game. But what would you say to people who like the spread gun as their favorite weapon? <laughs> 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 Do these people need to uh, crank up the difficulty in their lives a little bit more. I like the spread gun. <laughs> this is an indirect shot at Krista. Oh, no. Um, I think with Operation Galuga, you should try out some new weapons you maybe didn't like in the past. And I can say that, so I'm, I'm, I'm a converted spread shot user myself. Um, <laughs> and when we approached the weapons in Operation Galuga, I made a huge spreadsheet and I had all the data from 
old Contra games, uh, and Contra Four, and Spider Source, and I could see the all the like DPS values and how it all was balanced. And I was like, every weapon in OG has to be useful. It can't. We can't have these duds. It's it's pointless to have a dud weapon. Um, and so I now my favorite is the laser, because the level two laser ricochets around and hits multiple enemies. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. And I in the first Contra game, I hate the laser. <laughs> it's bad. So, um, we 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 put in a lot of work to try to make all the weapons useful. So so don't just gravitate towards the spread shot. Try out some new things and uh, spread shot's still there if you need it. It's fine. <laughs> you mentioned all the work you did with Konami, and I and I have to ask, like the Konami code has this like legendary status now, like. What is the level of self awareness within Konami in Japan today of of the Konami code? Um, when I pitched its inclusion in the game, there was no pushback at all. It was kind of assumed. It was like, yeah, the Konami. Have it. What are yeah. we doing? Yeah. <laughs> I think I think it was in my game design document just there, like before we knew what it was going to do. It was like the code's here, and they were like, yeah, yeah. So. I think it's a well-known thing. It's good to know. That bodes well. Yes, it's that, good to know. You yeah. never, you never yep. know. That's why I had to ask. Yeah. <laughs> um, one more question before we wrap up. Um, you've been at Way Forward for a long time. Do you have like a deep cut Way Forward game that if people have the chance, they should check out? Oh. After they play Contra, um, of course. I'll do one I worked on and one I didn't work on. Asterisk. Um, the one I worked on is Goosebumps the Game. It's on Switch. <gasps> I love it's Goosebumps. It's on Switch and the previous oh. generations as well. It's a point and click. It's really good. I had to write oh. the... In. You're getting that tonight. I'm getting it right <laughs> I had now. to write the equivalent of three Goosebumps books to do the text in that game. So it's like, it's like Shadowgate. New yeah. stories? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it new stories, new Goosebumps wow. style stories? Oh my gosh, I had a huge collection of Goosebumps books when I was a kid. So. It's... it's Right it was alley. licensed to tie into the Jack Black film, but it's a new, it's a, it's a side That's story. Right. It's not retelling yeah. the film. It's like a new, its own thing. So oh, I love it. it. And then I a game it. I didn't work on is, uh, that I don't think anyone can get anymore is Lit for WiiWare. It was a light based oh. puzzle game. There's a mobile version. I may have played I this. I may have played this game. I may have played that. You had yeah. to, you yeah, had to like break with those me. and then they'd bring a streak of light in or you'd have a desk That's light it. that rotates. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember this game. Oh, we were so there's a bad. there's a mobile Five, version sure. I did work yeah. on that you can play. But if anyone can find mm -hmm. the WiiWare one or never or downloaded it and never got to it, you should check it out. It's really cool. Okay. Mine is uh, this is actually one that I worked on as well. But after I moved over to Namco after working at Konami is Sigma Star Saga, which was a Game Boy Advance game, which was. A little bit ahead of its time as far as doing genre mashups. It's like an RPG meets a, like a, a Gradius kind of side-scrolling shooter game. Really, really cool. Might be a bit hard to track down, but <laughs> my, very, my very good game. Track down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's what you're trying to say. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many great way forward games from over the years. And it's like, that's cool to work at a company where like, even even we have our own hidden gems. Yes. <laughs> like so that, true. You have reached a special status when your own company has <laughs> hidden gems that everybody needs to check out. That's I true. think we're going to have a lot of people in our community checking out that Goosebumps game. Yeah, though. I know. Goosebumps is, is <laughs> yeah. perfect for our community. Yes. We, are all, we all kind of grew up around the same time, I yeah. think. So, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Well, this is awesome. We really appreciate you coming on to talk a little bit more uh, about Contra. Uh, again, there's there's a demo if people want to check it out, and the game's out now. So we wish you all the best of luck with the game. And uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks again so for much, coming guys. on. And we're back. Every time. I was reading again. I was reading the message. You know thing. it's coming. I don't know. I don't understand. What I the... don't know when. You just zone out for a few seconds? Yeah. Okay. Uh, love it's Tom. So great. Love getting a chance to talk to him. Such an and awesome person. Yeah, we had that great overlap at yes. uh, Konami, which is always fun to, to catch up with him and hear what, what's been going on. Yeah. But yeah, that, that point about way forward having this luck, it's not luck though. They obviously know what they're doing. They have right. this skill with these retro franchises that that a lot of companies maybe don't want to touch. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, there's something there that maybe more people should pay 
closer attention to yeah. or, or try some experiment with some different things? Because that could be a big opportunity. Exactly. I think they're uh, actually, you know, we talk a lot about video game preservation. Obviously, we just went to Digital Eclipse and they are doing video game preservation in their own unique way with these interactive documentaries. But I think WayForward is also doing video game preservation in their unique ways by bringing a lot of these like lost genres or genres that feel like um, it's hard to get a modern audience to pay attention to. And they're doing that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting that we have all these, you know, studios that are doing this kind of work, but they're all taking like a different angle, a different approach at it. But I'm glad that a lot of these games from our childhood isn't just lost forever and there's still um, a modern way to enjoy them. And, and I think WayForward is doing a great job yeah, with all of that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All right, we can uh, jump into some of the games that we've been playing, but first we got another great sponsor to shout out. Thank you, Notion, for sponsoring this episode. So Krista, there are so many uh, productivity tools out there, but a lot of times when you use them, you just feel like you're switching back and forth between one app to the next, and before you know it, the thing you wanted to do just got a lot more complicated yes. than before you even got this tool. But now there's Notion. Now there's Notion. Notion is so amazing because it combines all your notes, all your projects into one space, and it beautifully designs it for you, which is the most important thing mm. to me. I not only need things to be organized and you know easy to find and easy to share with you, but I need it to look nice. Yes. I don't want to work on a, a document or I don't want to work on um, projects where things look gross. Like I want the pretty templates. I want the beautifully designed, you know, decks and, th and things like that. So Notion does all of that for you, which is so, so awesome. That's right. And there's so many different applications for it, whether you're a big business and, you know, half of the Fortune 500 companies use it, small business like us. Even, uh, you know, if you're just a regular person out there trying to do stuff. Mm -hmm. Last time I talked about, you know, planning a group vacation. Yes. Now, uh, my mom has a big milestone birthday party coming up and planning that with some family members coming up in a couple yeah. months. And Notion has been great for just keeping track of yes. all the details, people all over the country don't need to get on all these mm -hmm. the late night phone calls or anything like that because it's all easy to follow in Notion. Uh, and I love that. Yeah. It's also doing great with some of the tedious tasks that you have, you know, with the, a two person company like ours, like anything that we can automate um, is very helpful. So we've been using Notion for that as well. Yes. yes. So try Notion for free when you go to notion.com slash kit and Krista. That's all lowercase letters, notion.com slash kit and Krista to try the powerful, easy to use Notion AI assistant today. And when you use our link, you are supporting our show, notion.com slash kit and Krista. I'll put the link right over here and also in the description below. Yeah. All right. Games for playing. We had a really fun stream last week where we checked out all of mm -hmm. the latest um, Switch releases. The new releases, because there were kind of a lot last yeah, week. So we yeah, so we've actually been playing quite a bit, but you have been, you you finished Llamasoft. I finished it. Yes. yes. Which is cool. Yes, yeah, so this is Llamasoft, the Jeff Minter story, which is the latest uh, interactive documentary from Digital Eclipse, who yeah. we visited, and that's what the kind of, you know, the new game that they were um, working on when we went to go see them. And the games that kind of preceded this are Atari 50 and uh, Karataka mm -hmm. um, game that they did. So this one really follows that same sort of format where there's like an interactive timeline and they have videos, they have archival like photos, other documents, um, things that they got from Jeff Minter himself. And then as you go along, you can, you know, when a game was released, you actually play that game. Right. Which um, is really interesting. And, you know, Jeff Minter is a name that I had heard of, but I never could say that I had played any of his games. I wasn't even familiar with his output very much. I remember, like, he started making games for Xbox Live Arcade on the 360, and they were very kind of, like, colorful, almost psychedelic, mm -hmm. like, sh like, arcade shooters. So that was kind of the one image that I had in mind for him. But it was really interesting to go through all the years and see his, his work was much more varied than that. Yeah. Like he was definitely inspired by like classic um, older arcade games, but there was a lot more than just those shooters. 
And I also came to realize why I was not as familiar with his games as other people in that time. Because, you know, he's in the UK, mm -hmm. which had this sort of contrast with consoles right. that the United States had. Like, the UK was more into these, like, game-oriented PCs, like the Commodore. Yeah. Or the ZX Spectrum is oh, one that you often ZX. hear about. I love saying Z instead of Z. It sounds so much better. <laughs> so much more sophisticated. <laughs> Z. When we were at Nintendo, we um, we were doing something for the Lego Lego, uh, Lego City Lego Undercover. Lego, yes, Lego City Undercover. And one of the developers came to visit, and his name was Laws, L-O-Z. Yes. And I remember him introducing himself to one of our coworkers. Right. He's like, hi, hi, I'm Laws, obviously in a British accent. And yes. he was like, what? Your what? Your name's what? Loss, L O Z, and this guy just <laughs> was so he confused. He didn't get it. He was like Z. <laughs> he L O what? Z? Who's that? Now he I'm even more confused. Squinted at him with confusion on his face, and I was like, "Let's go." Right, but that helped to explain. Like, okay, I didn't have a Commodore. Commodore was not, you know, the biggest thing yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so that helped me to understand the the story of like, okay. This is why maybe you missed he, he it. He was bigger in a different market, and this now makes it understandable why I didn't get it. Uh, he also has this, you know, interesting fascination with farm animals, which yes. is why the company is named Llamasoft, and the games often feature llamas and camels and sheep and sheep. and yep. all of that. So, you know, along the way, you 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 learn about his design philosophy, but you also see like how he's making games. He's like in the English countryside and he's got these farm animals with him. Yes. You're about these trips he made to like Peru to go visit llamas, the llamas and, and yeah. all, this, cool. all this fun stuff. So you really do get like a peek behind the curtain of like who these people are and what makes them tick. And that's why, mm -hmm. that's what I like about this series is even if it's not something I'm previously interested in, I know I'm going to have something interesting that I will learn about exactly. it. Exactly, yeah. Like with Karatika, like I really was like, I've heard of this game, I don't know what it is. Right. I kind of could take it or leave it, but it was so well done and there was like such a strong story narrative through it that I, it was, you know, one of my favorite games of last year. Right. So that said, so this is the third one that they've done. I think the other two are maybe a little bit stronger mm -hmm. for some of those reasons where like it, it didn't have as strong of a story arc mm -hmm. as the other two. Okay. Like with Atari, we know that that is historically important. Yeah, historically important. So it's like, okay, <clears throat> like there's a reason why this story is being told and it's all, you know, it is very dramatic too. Like a lot of stuff that happened behind the scenes of Atari is right. very, very dramatic and it's, and it's kind of like the birth of an industry as we know it kind of started in a big way there. Mm -hmm. So it's like, all right, this is this is truly like museum worthy stuff. And then with Karatika, they just again had all of this archival material from Jordan Mechner, who was yeah. just like a meticulous journaler. Right. And they just had all of this stuff that was fascinating to like look directly into his brain. But then they also had this really sweet like father-son story that yeah. I wouldn't have ex expected anywhere. And all the videos with him, it was like him and his dad. And mm -hmm. it was talking about how his dad like... Even his sister too. Right. Like this family dynamic that they yes. had in, in the making of Karataka was really cool to right. see. Right, 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 right. So there were kind of some different narrative arcs in that one that I didn't expect that really carried it and elevated that one. Yeah. With Lomasoft, like there was not necessarily as much like friction or like moments of tension. Mm. It was it was more just like it was more of an A to B like this is what happened over the years. Like yeah. not to say that there wasn't any. Like there was um, a publishing partner he had and you know him kind of struggling to work through the evolution of the industry, like it was harder for him to get funding at certain points, like he almost ran out of money at certain points, but I wouldn't say like, those other games had almost like movie quality stories. Yeah. Whereas this one was a bit more straight, for straight, focus. straightforward. Yeah. Um, I get, but that said, I did learn a lot and probably of the three, this was the most eye-opening as far as seeing and playing the games. Like with Atari, like I knew a decent number of those. Mm -hmm. I got exposed to some others, but I kind of knew what it was going into it. 
Parodica was just, it's one game. Right. So they have a million different versions of Karatika, but in the end, it's like, this is Karatika. Yeah. So there was a bit of a limited impact with this. Like, this thing has a lot of games into yeah. it. And it was interesting to see how varied they are. And a lot of them are, are still fun to play today. Mm -hmm. And he does have some really interesting takes on game concepts that you... I was like, I've never really seen anything like that before. I don't yeah. how he thought of that. So it was eye-opening in that sense. So I think it, you know, it's like as I grade these, these, now that we have three of these, I kind of grade these on different scales of like, you know, historical impact, the story, and then like the games. Yeah. Like they all kind of rise for different reasons. I think this one's highest for the games, maybe a little bit lower for the other two. Yeah. So I liked it, but I, I I wouldn't necessarily say it's it's stronger than the others. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the cool thing about this, and we looked at it a little bit, is like these games are incredibly complex, even though they seem very yeah. kind of like basic arcade stuff on the surface. They, they It's funny, they have um, a little scale that's like how many llamas is right, it? Right, and right, that, right. that means how complex it is. Yeah. With like these ridiculous manuals that are like pages and pages and pages. Yeah. So you really can kind of get a glimpse into Jeff Minter's head where you're like, What's he doing? You know, it's like very unique gameplay mechanics that look so simple on the surface but are incredibly complex. Um, and that mixed with like the psychedelic color palette and like the farm animals is like this person is very special. You know? Yeah. Like, this person is looking at the world in a very different way. Yeah, yeah. And that's cool to see. Mm -hmm. It like manifested in this way, you know. So. And he's still around, and he's still making games. So yeah, exactly. It's, it's it's a very and he still has sheep. Long and storied career. Yes, he does. Good yes. for him. I'm happy for him. The other thing we've been playing is more Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and our spoiler cast for this game is coming next week. Is that right? Yes. I think that's right. We are both playing to beat the game this week, which yes. will give us plenty of time to compose our thoughts and have a really great conversation about Very it. Very exciting. There, I'm, I'm afraid to even ask you for any updates this oh, week, though. I can't though. Give any updates. Nothing? Everything is very spoiler heavy. Is it? I think <laughs> really? so. Really? I think we're, we're both around the same yeah. chapter now. Um, things have happened. We are What's your hour count? 32. Okay, I think I'm at like 35. Okay, yeah. Um, we have been traveling around with the party. Um, different characters have been put into the spotlight. That is one thing I really like about this game, mm. is that there's a lot of different characters that you're yes. traveling with. Obviously, your party is quite large, you know, you know and most, most times in the game, you can only have you and two other people yeah. in, in your party. But they do a lot of fun stuff where they like kind of almost like force you to play as all of the different characters. They like force you to do sections of the game playing with a character that you normally don't um, choose, at least for me. Um, so I really like that they do that because or else I feel like I can go through the whole game and never play as that character. Um, so that was really good, really cool. And I Did really the original like game do that? Did, th did that have moments where it's like now you're just playing as these two characters for a stretch? I don't think so. Okay. And I can't remember now. That's a question I had for you. And I feel like no. Like I feel like you were always Cloud. It feels like something they wouldn't have done. Because again, the thing I keep going back to is like, okay, the original game is probably 40 hours long. And now they're making three... Yeah. hours that are at least 40 hours long. Right. How are they coming up with this I extra material? This I, this that, feels like yeah. something that they added in. Right. It doesn't feel like filler at all. No, it doesn't feel like filler. And, I'm, and it's, <laughs> in a lot of cases, I'm glad they did, because like you were saying, they're characters that I might have otherwise just like put in the back. I'm like, yeah, not yeah. going to use you. My, my normal party is, I pretty much stick, stick with the same few characters. I've yeah. been really loving Cloud, Barrett, Aerith in my party. Mm. That's my like typical party. But yeah, in some sections of the game, they either do things where they split you into two groups yeah. and you play one section as one group mm -hmm. and then one section as the other group, or they like lock your party. They're like, you can only do this section yeah. with these two people and that's it. And you, you have to do it. And like, yeah, I, I did a section where I played as a character that I typically don't. And I was like, oh, this is actually kind of fun. Like, I like this. It feels kind of like a different game, yeah. you know, playing as this character in this way. Um, but I really do like that the game sort of, you know, gives you opportunities to do that. But yeah, now I'm I'm in like some spoiler, uh, heavy territory right now. 
um, in terms of where I am chapter wise. Uh -huh. We're almost you know, near, yeah. near the end now and things are happening. There was a, a bit of confusion that you were experiencing that I had to explain to you. I, I felt like this might be where you might feel a little bit like overwhelmed by the story because it gets a little wild towards well, the end here. I think I'm doing okay. When I finish this, I do want to go watch several different story explainers yes. to just catch up on things that I might have missed. And I you also should. and I also want to watch something that's based on the original game. You should. So that I can have a better understanding of the differences. Because you've clearly forgotten everything important. No, I'm not, I have not. Um, but there are definitely things that I'm like, that's not what happened. But I, I want to confirm. Yeah, I do want to know. I do want to know the big differences. Yeah. In that storytelling. There's some. There's something that happened recently that I was like, wait a second. And people <laughs> keep talking about the connections to Crisis Core. Yes. So that that game's actually on sale at the moment. So I do think I'm going to get that. I don't okay. know if I'm going to be able to fully play through it, but yeah. I do just want to load it up and check it out and see what that's yeah. all about. Yeah. So, yeah, even even once we finish the game, so we got some more prep to do before the the big spoiler cast. How are you feeling about the the battle system which we've it's been taking us weeks to fully wrap because I think I think I've reached the point where it's like I'm 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 good I'm with this now. I'm pretty good with it now. Yeah. Like I feel good. Okay. I feel like I know exactly what I'm doing now. I have all my stuff tuned perfectly with uh, the material that I yeah. like. I know exactly how to, you know, what spells to use first, second. Like, I just feel like I got that down. Yeah. Like, these boss fights are no, no longer an issue for me. You've got a couple coming up that might be an issue. Oh, really? There's some tough ones coming up. Okay, yeah. the ones I just did in, in the chapter before. Yeah. Um, those are really fun. I, yeah. I enjoyed those, yeah. and I didn't feel um, like I was, like, doing poorly or anything like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like al it. I also... We'll talk more about this in the spoiler cast. Remember when we first started playing this game, I was like, I have some skepticism about the open world aspects. Like I feel like there's a catch or I feel like there's something. Yeah. I'm back to feeling that way. Okay. <laughs> and I'm really starting to ask myself, did they need these open world portions of the game because We've also talked, I think last week we talked about the pacing, <clears throat> how it can be a long stretch of time where you are away from the open world. Yeah. And then you can be there and then you can do stuff. And it's like the pacing of, of how they intersperse that with the story stuff is strange. I found myself with each new area I go to doing less and less, less mm. of the open world stuff. And I contrast that to the people that I've seen being most down on the game are the people who feel compelled to do a lot of the open world stuff. Like they can't help themselves? Which I don't see a lot of, I mean, yes, it's if, if you want to explore the world, that's fine, but the, the rewards that the game gives you, I feel are basically nothings. Yeah, I mean, you could just go to little robot Chadley and he can give you a little materia for it. He's not giving me any material that I don't really have right. or, or need at the moment. Yeah, it's nothing rare, right? Um, right, especially when you contrast it with like how many hours would it take me? Because I was listening, so I told you, I was listening to the Next Lander podcast, which is a great podcast. Yeah. And they, had, they were talking about how they had played the game about as much as we did. Mm -hmm. And they were only in the second open world area I can't because they that. were they felt compelled to 100% I can't believe each that. of those areas yeah, and I, I feel like that's a recipe for burning out on this game yeah i feel like you i mean or or not maybe you're just so in love with this world that you because there's i mean i won't say how many but there's several more of those areas to come uh yeah they're going to be there for a while they have they're feeling the need to to 100% yeah. every region um, yeah, I, I have mixed feelings about the open world section as well, mainly from the pacing issues. And the reason is, is that I feel like because the game locks you into such long stretches where you're not able to explore, it's a little bit difficult to like shift your mindset into, oh yeah, yeah now I can explore. Right, right, right. And it, it, it's not like Tears of the Kingdom in that way where... You feel like the whole game is you exploring and the story and sort of the those sections are very like at your own whim and p timing. 
this is like yeah once you get once you get locked into a, like a big long story segment like you're in you cannot leave you cannot do anything else you have to do this and and then to like kind of go back to that more like free explore it's just tough to get your head to do that yeah so that that's my main problem i still do a bit of exploring in every new area at least try to get you know as many towers as i can easily see and, and get to um because i do want to walk around the regions that i'm in and just like look at it and it's like pretty and nice to look at but other than that yeah i have been definitely exploring less than i was yeah. in the first area i think i asked you this before but again since i never played the original game that game had an overworld yes that, you just go to town to but town it was, kind of thing. Could, I, you could still somewhat walk meander around that there was nothing to do necessarily right right because I, I would i'd be so curious if there's any interviews where they talked about this but maybe this was their solve for the overworld was having these big open areas where you're I going so. from place yeah. to place. It, must, it makes sense. Yeah. It's a big contrast from, you know, an open world where your your goal is to just walk to the next thing to yeah. have these gigantic open areas. Right. Where you really have to give people things to do. And they try. To give them motivation to fully explore it. Yeah. That's the thing. I think the motivation is is tough and especially when you sort of gain momentum exploring it, but then lose all of it when you go into a story section. Yeah. You can't come back to it. Right, right, right. So that, that that part, I think, is a little bit, that kind of back and forth is a little bit challenging. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm still doing, I'm still definitely exploring every new place I'm at. I still get, you know, the towers. I'll do some of the little challenges. It's like along my way of running around. Some of them are really fun. Some of the towers kind of have like a, Tears of the Kingdom, Breath of the Wild quality to it, where there's like a little puzzle that you have to do to mm -hmm. be able to um, synchronize it. So I kind of like that, you know, it has that kind of feel to it. Um, and th those are always nice breaks between the big story dungeons or story sections. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying though. And I, I don't know how someone is trying to 100% it because I think that would be so hard. And yeah, it might cause you to like get halfway into the game and be like, I can't play this anymore because it's been thousands of hours and I haven't yeah. 100%ed the second area yet, right. you know? That's last, tough. I think last week I also said that, that the stretch that we had just done before we recorded that episode, I felt pretty confident that that was going to be the low point yeah. of the game. I'm pretty sure I was right Unless about Unless there's that. something that happens at the yeah. end. Because after that, like, everything got back on track and it's yeah. been really fun and it hasn't felt like it's dragged or they're asking me to do nonsense. And yeah. nobody's asked me to, to. Nobody's forced me to play Queen's Blood again, which I, okay. which I appreciate. I I, I um, gained two new ranks. Oh great! In Queen's Good Blood. Good for you. Um, after we got out of the the bad area, uh -huh. <laughs> it's not really that bad, but yeah, I went to the next area and there was like more Queen's Blood challengers, and I got new cards. I'm a I'm a formidable Queen's Blood player now. I would say. Okay. Yeah. All right. There you go. Big release for new games this Friday. So there's Dragon's Dogma. Mm -hmm. We'll have our impressions of that next week. Princess Peach? Are you getting Princess Peach? Yes or no? No. No, you're not getting it. I'm not going to get it. What about with the voucher? No, I don't really want to play this game. All right. I'm going to play Dragon's Dogma. Uh, Rise of the Ronin is also out. I saw that. I haven't, I don't know too much about this game. I think I'll skip that one. Yeah, unless there's a reason not to. Yeah. I'll, I'll keep my eye, one eye open. It looks beautiful, but is it Ghost of Tsushima, basically? I don't know. Uh, Someone tell me if they, I should uh, play this game. What else? I'm going to get I'm gonna get Princess Peach. Okay. I don't know if I'm going to go to it immediately. Okay. But I do want to see what that's all yeah. about. Maybe it, at least check out the other levels and see. And I'm really not joking, like... It will be a nice change of pace from these yeah. games that we've been playing lately, which yeah, are just yeah. so no, big totally. and so involved yeah. of just something that's And then a you're going bit... into Dragon's Dogma, which is also a big involved I game. know. <laughs> yeah, but I, I was thinking, I like, I'm so happy that Dragon's Dogma is, like, dark fantasy again, because I've been, I played, obviously, we've been playing um, uh, Like a Dragon, which is, like, very modern, and uh -huh. then, like, Final Fantasy, which is, like, kind of, like, futuristic-ish. Um... But I was like, I miss fantasy. I want to go back to fantasy. So, like, I was playing just a little bit of the beginning of that game to get my pawn ready yeah. for delivery. Yeah. 
And I was like, I saw like the, the opening cutscene and like just like the opening cinematic stuff. And I'm like, oh, this feels good. Uh, oh, I like the <laughs> dark throne this room. This is grimy. You know, like chain mail. This looks like it smells bad. I oh, like it. Yeah, like yeah. cool, like kind of like, you know, mythical monsters. I was like, oh. Oh, I like this. <laughs> I, felt, I felt really happy. I was really, really glad. Oh, good. Yeah, I have been, I do like the idea of like a little chill game, though. I've yeah. continued my Balatro mm. shenanigans. Are you going to get that on phone? That's coming out on phones. Thank God. Yeah, I, I love it um, so much. It's totally been my little like, oh, 15 minutes, I'll do this. And then I'll like play my big, yeah. you know, settle in for my big gameplay night. Yeah. Um, with Final Fantasy, but I, I do agree that everybody needs like a little palate cleanser game, and if Princess Peach can be that for you yeah. after this, would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, time for some news. Yes. Jeff Keighley has declared oh. that Summer Game Fest okay. shall return, and it is coming back on June seventh. Mm -hmm. We are getting the big live stream, as he says, Summer Game Fest streams from the YouTube Theater in LA with thousands of in-person fans and millions watching online get a glimpse of what is next in video games. There's also some other stuff that wasn't in the tweet. The in-person event, which we've been to the last two years, mm -hmm. is returning. It's gonna run that weekend, so June 7th is a Friday. The in-person event runs through the weekend. Yeah. And yeah, we were we were starting to wonder, like, gosh, we're in March when is now. When's this gonna be? Yeah. Kind of trying to plan our own schedules, like, yeah. when is this gonna happen? And poop, there it is. Yep. And I am so curious to see this year, full first proper year with no E three, no specter of E three, yes. no canceled E three moments before. Like, how does how does that how, does, how does every company approach this summer? Yeah. Do we get the cluster of news in June, or do people try and try to get some breathing room, try and right. carve out some space for themselves? I really, I really don't know. Or who who gets just gets in on this now that there sure. is no E three? Like, okay, then we can definitely sure. sort of hitch our wagon to this now, like one hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, he certainly you know has not been hurting for support the last couple all. years. So yeah. I think I think this will still be really big. But I guess I lean towards, or I hope I hope more companies will use the extra time in the summer to not feel like we have to compete with each other like within the same week. Mm. I think there's some benefits to spreading things out a bit. You I disagree. Kinda, I kind of like having it all. Well, you like it. I like it because as But is a that consumer, is, is that best for all these games and all these companies? It depends. I think that there is an opportunity to draft off the excitement and, and people just like I'm gonna dedicate this week. My attention is on the games industry. Like I'm, I'm here for all the gaming news. I know it's all gonna happen this week. Mm -hmm. um, so there is that kind of like you have my attention. Show me what you got, everyone mentality. Okay. But yes, of course, there is a lot of competition as well. And if you are not like a big budget publisher, like you can get buried, and that can be really tough for you. But if you're able to, you know, kind of draft onto that mo that momentum and, and the attention that people are already paying to what's happening around that timing, it's just almost like they're like Pavloved into it, you know, at this point, um, it could be all right. It could be all right for you. We complained about E3, we ended E3, so we could do a thing that became exactly like E3. <laughs> we are go. humans. Way this to go, game do. industry. <laughs> no, seriously though, this is what we do. We're like literally humans, so yeah. We got a couple PlayStation stories here. Oh yes. These stories about the PS5 Pro have kind of exploded. They really have. To again to our point about about leaks, like it is so widespread and like people have like a lot of tangible information about mm -hmm. specs and stuff like that that it feels like this is pretty likely going to happen. Yeah. So it is supposedly on track to be released this holiday season, mm -hmm. which would be awesome because that's what I predicted in our predictions episode. Did, That'd be awesome yeah. for me if that happened. And predictions are looking very shaky this year. Well, I, I, I gotta say something about that. Tell me. We had a lot of predictions about the Switch 2. Mm. When we made those, I think those were extremely accurate. Yes. We didn't predict that there would be an internal delay. We did not predict to next year, exactly. And that's gonna that's gonna hurt a lot of our predictions. Yeah. But in the moment, I wouldn't have, I think that felt right in the moment. 
We'll and see. I think at that time, that was still what Nintendo was shooting for. Get ready for that pie in the That's face. That's my feeling. You're going to get it too. You don't know. Mine could be right. These specs for the PlayStation 5, I'm not qualified to comment on these. because Can I don't... someone explain this to me, please? I don't understand what this means. I don't understand what, what any of these what things are. What is a... Two to four two X to four ray X tracing ray... improvement. I know what wow. ray tracing is, but I don't understand. Do you? This... What is it? Isn't it? Okay. You don't have a clue. <laughs> you don't have a clue. Ah, don't ask any bold questions. <laughs> then don't say you know it. Okay, but no, I do know. Let me think. It's like how you... Okay, You're just going to embarrass yourself. So, yeah, I mean, yes, the numbers are bigger. Great. What is a custom machine learning AI upscale? What is that? Do you know what I, that well, is? So, so there is that, that thing called a DLSS where basically you can, the, the, without having, actually having the hardware to render at these higher res resolutions, it can kind of approximate it that way. So I do, I do know something vaguely about that. Don't look this up right now. You're not gonna read from a Wikipedia page on this beautiful podcast. Light transport, okay. Right. I just wanted to look, I'm just So yes, now. It's, it's a pro version of the hardware, the numbers are gonna be bigger. But again, I think we maintain that like, who wants this, who needs this? What this is doing is feeding the corporate, uh, the Sony corporate need to have something that'll sell this holiday yeah. season because you don't have yeah. a game. And the you know <sighs> the the buzz is is kind of slowing down on the PS5. Right, so that's kind of, crazy though. It's been so short. They just got their stock stuff figured out. It's been four out. years. Yeah, it's been four. It years. Hasn't been very short. I guess you're. Right. I mean, this is probably about the same time frame that we got the PS4 Pro. Wow. But I agree. It's like already, huh? I'm not surprised that we're getting a Pro, but why right. now? Again, beyond whatever they need to do to juice their numbers. How much is this thing going to be? That's it's going to be so, that's so a big question. expensive. Is it going to be like $800? So they could keep, they could keep, they could lower the price of the base PS5 and keep yeah. this at $500. That would probably be smart. They're not going to do that. But they probably won't. They'll probably keep, and this could be like $600 yeah. maybe. That starts to get a little dicey. They, they have two, <laughs> two versions Because again, use? they need money. <laughs> Money. So you can't drop a price when you need some money. Yeah, they're not going to drop the price. No way. Right. Um, I've wow. seen I've seen other people saying that's a doozy. I've seen people saying this feels a little big brainish too. They are getting a head start on being the console of choice for Grand Theft Auto Six. Okay. Because that's going to that. be that game's going to be demanding. That's a monster game. You're gonna to want to get a PS5 Pro to play GTA 6. To run it. Oh, you seem to have fallen for this hook, bait, and sinker. <laughs> You're a sucker. Better than saving my money now. You're a Jeez. sucker. Wow. No, it's gonna run on PS5 normal. It'll be fine. It'll be just fine. Well, Do you remember when we were playing Ghost of Tsushima? Ghost of Tsushima and Final Fantasy VII yes. Remake? Yes, yes. On, on the PS4. On, on a base. Of like a launch day PlayStation 4. Yeah, it was fine. I was floored by how good those games looked. Those games looked so good, yeah. especially Ghost of Tsushima, which not, had like a lot of graphical demands. Yeah, I'm not worried about this. I have zero interest in this at all. This is this is kind of some corporate chicanery. Did you see the light leave my eyes right just about now when I was like, hmm, do I need this? We did this with the with the uh, what was it called? The the PlayStation, the handheld. The handheld what was it called? The, the portal. Portal. We did that a few weeks ago. I got over that real fast. Though. You're over that. You though? Did you get? Did you secretly buy one? Not yet. But I'm kind of interested <laughs> still. Anyways, I'm very like this is. I'm susceptible to this. You see, I'm very susceptible to this. You didn't have a PS4 Pro. I did not have a PS4 yeah. Pro because I moved on to PS5 pretty fast. Did I get my PS? I got my PS4 kind of late in the life cycle. I, I really? Remember. Yeah. Oh. I feel like I did. I All feel right. like I was borrowing my friends for a long time. And then I got my own, like, mm. late in the life cycle. Anyways. There were a lot of caveats. I mean, the PS4 Pro, people seem to like, but there were a lot of caveats of, like, the. it seemed to be very focused on, you know, delivering 4K at the time, which I was like, I can't see the difference. Yeah. So maybe this isn't for me. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so do you think hmm. if they do this mid-gen leap, yeah. does Xbox do it too? Oh, Xbox can't help themselves. Mm. They're supposedly announcing new hardware they this are, holiday. Yeah. Announcing, not coming out with. Well, who knows what exactly it is? Yeah. Some well, some news. Sarah I mean, Bond said it's the biggest technological well, that, leap you've ever seen in your well, life. No, 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 no. That's the next Xbox. Okay. That's not what's coming this holiday. 
They might. They might be on the same. Don't twist Sarah Bond's words. I'm sorry, Sarah Bond. Don't do that. Should be a little bit more clear, but whatever. Um, I feel like they are always going to want to compete with P with PlayStation. So I wouldn't be surprised if they had some sort of like pro version or whatever. But Series S and X are both selling like pretty well for them, right? Or no? What? Xbox. Doing terrible. Really? And remember, there was that thing of the Series S is selling way more than the X. I don't think there's a chance in the world that they do this. Really? Yeah, I think they're just, I think they're like, we're going to ride out this generation. We're going to mm. focus on the future. Clearly, chasing power is in, not in this generation not the, not is, is, the... not, is not the move. People are struggling to make games for these systems already. And, that, and what, we're going to split split our audience with, with this stuff? No. I, I see them definitely being more focused on something like a handheld or some other sort of side piece. Oh, that's right. Side it was piece. the rumored handheld was yeah. what they were thinking. What, what we were thinking that they were going to do. Yeah. Let's move on. You're getting a little <laughs> far know. afield here. I don't know. We'll see. Reports are Sony has stopped production on the PlayStation VR 2 oh, yeah. as the unsold inventory has piled up. Yikes. This thing costs $550. I had to remind myself of how much that cost. I don't do VR. I'm not a VR person. So I was never in the market for this, but it did feel like kind of from day one, this was not as hot an item as the original PlayStation VR, which a lot of people liked. This thing is ridiculous. <laughs> That's so expensive. That's a lot of money. That's of more all, than the hardware itself. For like a type of experience that has just a very niche audience, like you can say what you will about VR being the future, blah, 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 but it doesn't matter because it is such like a barrier to enter for a lot of people that yeah i just i i can't believe how much how expensive that was and and really they have not supported it at all and yeah i have really not done much to put games on it or whatever that people want to play on playstation vr so yeah it's like i'm not surprised yeah i mean the last one had that um astrobot game that people really liked and it seemed to have a bit more support like if you yeah. were to ask me like what is the big PSVR 2 game to get. I'd say I don't, tell I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't either. Re Resident Evil. Maybe. Resident I mean, they, they, Evil. they support Resident Evil like crazy with VR stuff. Maybe, probably, maybe something like that, but I don't, I don't know. So yeah, yeah. They, they, they probably should do this and they probably wow. should not have pull out of this in the future yeah. <laughs> unless they have a better plan exactly. for it um, going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Focus more just on the main console itself. Last story, update on Sea of Stars, yeah. the game you played last year. I did. Past 5 million copies sold. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. And they are adding this co-op update, which is interesting. They're calling yeah. this Single Player Plus. They had an extremely short video that they posted. It's like, I'm like, I'm serious, like under 10 seconds <laughs> of the characters kind of running around independently on uh, the game world. The information they shared is very light. But they do talk about, um, you know, lining up your timed hits with other players. I didn't play this game, so I don't know. Like, would this be worthwhile to come back to and experience again with another person? Might be fun. Um, interesting that the co-op is a three-player co-op. Could probably do two-player. Um, okay. Uh, I, I just never saw, saw that, seen that before. Um, a three-player. Well, there's three characters, right? Right, right. Yeah. There's three characters. Um, well, there's more than three characters, but yes, you, your playable characters are three. Um, but yeah, the, the a lot of the mechanics are around timing and sort of, you know, it's like that thing where you like volley attacks back and forth between you and the enemy. So I can uh, see that being something that'd be fun to do if you're doing like timed attacks or something like that with your friends. Um, the best part about this game, though, was the story. So I, I, don't, I don't know if you want to replay it. I guess you can try to get a different ending or something like that. But yeah, and it, it's a it's a pretty long game as well. So you, you have to be really like dedicated to playing this with another person for the entirety of the game. But it, it's cool that they're adding this. I'm always interested in these updates that come out a little bit past, you know, a game's kind of peak yeah, interest. Exactly. Which are clearly meant to like, you know, draw people back and maybe draw in some new people. I always wonder like how effective are those? Right. For me, it's like I 
I didn't play the game originally. I'm like, all right, that's that's okay, but I, yeah. it doesn't feel like something that's going to really draw me in. Yeah, and for me, I played the game, original game. I absolutely loved it, but I don't know if I'd replay it with somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Congrats for selling $5 million, though. Yeah. We are going to get into some questions from our community. Uh, we get all of these questions from our Patreon community. We have a great piece of bonus content up on Patreon, which is the extended conversation that we had with Chris Kohler from Digital Eclipse when yes. we went to go visit there. A little bit of that made it into our vlog, yeah. which we posted, but this is the full uncut 20 minute something conversation. Mm -hmm. Yes. That is up for every tier of Patreon subscriber, even free. Right. So. You can become a subscriber and check it out. Yes. Yes. First question is from Timmy V. Paper Mario Thousand Year Door and Luigi's Mansion 2 HD just had their release dates revealed. As I look up the dates on the calendar, I notice they both release on a Thursday. I remember Nintendo used to release their games on Sundays during the Wii to mid Wii U era. My question is, what do you think Nintendo's release strategy is going forward? Do you think this will help with Switch 2 sales if they kickstart releasing them earlier in the week? Hmm, interesting. So currently games come out on Fridays. Yeah, Fridays. But that yeah. was not always the case. Right, right. When, yeah, I guess it did switch over um, in like a 3S era. Yeah. I think that's when we started to have pretty much every game coming out on Friday. And then, of course, um, for digital games, you would get them the evening of Thursday, like 9 yeah. p.m. Pacific time. Right, right, right. To, um, to, to like, align with the Friday release. Yeah, I think the strategy was, you know, you would, like, then have, like, a full weekend of sales data, sales information. And then we would always have, like, a big, like, launch weekend meeting to talk about, like, sales and forecasts, like, on that following Monday. Would... They changed their strategy to release the games earlier in the week. I think it's tough because they've typically used the earlier parts of the week to reveal like news and stuff like that or to make announcements about other things. So I'm not sure if they would move the release timings to like potentially conflict with that. So it's a pretty crunchy kind of update here, pretty insidery stuff. I have to imagine it's either requests from retailers saying this day works better for us or some sort of um, data that they have or have been given mm -hmm. saying, hey, this is a big day for the category. Yeah. You might want to consider getting on this or there's some trend that's happening. I, d I don't see it, you know, to the question, will this skyrocket sales going forward? Probably not. Yeah. But there must be some information that they have that is leading them down this path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Linko asks, hey, years ago you traveled to Nintendo HQ in Kyoto to record a video showing us what it's like inside the building. How was that trip, I wonder? Because it seemed you were not allowed to enter the main areas, leaving you two in the kitchen. I got a feeling you were disappointed with the reception. <laughs> <laughs> this is an amazing question. So we got inside that building all we wanted to. We just couldn't film it. Right. <laughs> to, be, to be honest, us even proposing this was a real Hail Mary long shot mm -hmm. that I at least, I don't know about you, I was shocked when they said, they yeah, said, you yeah, should do you it. Should do it. Yeah, I was shocked too. Um, just to be clear, we when we were going to Kyoto, we were actually going there for like other work reasons. Like we were going there for like big strategy meetings and like, other things, we weren't just proposing that they let us fly to Kyoto to film a video. They would never let us do that. So we basically the idea was we were already going to be there for these big meetings um, or we were attending, I think a couple of times we were attending Nintendo Live or some sort of event that was happening mm -hmm. in Japan. And we basically kind of had, yeah, like a Hail Mary creative idea like, hey, wouldn't it be fun to, if they let us shoot a Nintendo Minute video as well while we were already there doing these meetings. And that was a very, like, it would be nice if they let us do it, but they probably won't. Yeah. And in that case, that's fine because we had other work that no we were expectations doing either. anyway, yeah. and we had no expectations. Yeah. But they did let us somehow do this, and they were very strict with where we were allowed to film. 
But yes, we were, we were definitely in the building, like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the building is nothing to write home about. Let me just tell you that right now. Yeah. I was sort of disappointed. I mean, I thought it was cool that we could even show that much. I know. Because, like, yeah. there, you know, you just don't see anything, any footage or any pictures. Yeah. Uh, even though, you know, every day there's like hundreds, if not thousands of tourists who are like trying to get in the gates to see a picture of the, so that, poor, them, that poor security yeah. guard is just shooing, shooing them all shooing people away. away. I feel bad for And them. we do have some other fun stories about this that we'll share when we actually go to Japan yeah. later this year. Yes. But um, um, this is a, such a funny question. Though. Yeah, I love it. Ninja Eleven's next. I have a question relating to cinematic game trailers. When a company releases a teaser trailer for a game with no gameplay, how far into development are they usually? Pokemon Legends ZA's trailer announcement for 2025 having no gameplay makes me wonder how much of the game they actually have made at this moment. I'm glad they're taking their time on the game, but on the other hand, we don't know how much development has been done. Typically, the mainline games that release later in a hardware's life or on its deathbed are pretty and take full advantage of the console. Look at how pretty Black, White, Black and White 2 and Ultimate Sun, Ultimate Moon were, and they released after the next hardware released. I'm a bit nervous, so I want to know if you think they have already done a lot of work on the game before the announcement. So a couple things at play here. Last game got torn to shreds for visual problems, mm -hmm. so they're going to want to make sure this is looking as good as it can before they start to show it, because the same thing's gonna, people, you know, people are like looking for this now. Yeah. Like, let's pick this apart. Yes. It looks bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing is, you know, 2025, the Switch family of systems, what exactly is this coming out for? Right. And, you know, are they tipping their hand if they show something for the game? Are they gonna wait until they have a Switch 2 version that will obviously look much better, mm -hmm. and that could be the first thing that they show, and that can be all, all of the visuals that they show for the game, and then like the day before they put out a, a Switch screenshot looks terrible. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think there are a lot, a of, lot factors of factors at play, but I am not a fan of cinematic trailers, like CG trailers mm -hmm. like this, because like a lot of people, I just want to see the game. Yeah, you don't and, get a good sense of it. And that. I don't know what, what I can take away from a CG trailer. So mm -hmm. I'm still surprised. Like, remember that the Xbox showcase from last year was all CG? Yeah. I'm like, wow, even, even today, like, I just don't know what the point of that is. Yeah. Um, your question about how far along into development this game is, there they probably are, you know, in development. Yeah. Into the, the they're probably pretty well along. Well along, I was gonna say, yeah, they just don't want to show you show you the gameplay right, right now for all these these other reasons. Um, but yeah, I, I get the idea of wanting to make like a dramatic cinematic trailer and, and to get people, you know, to get excited about the game. But I'm with you. I think when it's too much, just like cutscenes and things like that shown in a trailer, like it's hard. It gets it's really hard for me to understand like what the gameplay loop is. And that's when I get a little bit worried, like, well, what is it going to feel like to play this game? I don't have any idea. Yeah. 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 Marvin25 has a question. Hi, Kit and Krista. I actually collect all the Amiibo that get released in the U.S. With that said, I noticed that Nintendo has been restocking old Amiibo, Amiibo that haven't been released in years. For example, I've seen older Smash Brothers, not DLC Amiibo, old Zelda, Breath of the Wild and other games, getting restocked and re-released this year. I don't see them having any reason to do it. Do you have any insight? Hmm. So they've been doing this for a while. Yeah. I think there's a couple things here. You know, the first is in retail, you have a limited amount of shelf space mm -hmm. that you really do need to constantly be using. I was going to say, or yeah. if you don't use it, you lose it. Again, the use it or lose it philosophy yes. <laughs> is very much in play here. So you're going to want to constantly have something on the shelf and you may not always want to just be putting the same old thing that you feel like you've sold through. Right. So if you, you know, a lot of those early, they have really limited runs. Mm -hmm. So they know, like, yeah, there probably still is some demand for this old, like, Captain Falcon Yeah, there's some amiibo. collectors out there that are still looking for right. this. Right. So, yeah. you know, let's take advantage of the space that we have. Let's not just constantly reprint the latest amiibo that we have, but let's take advantage of this big library that we have. Yeah. And just kind of, you know, intersperse it out there. 
and um, use it use it selectively that way. They do also realize like there are some hurt feelings with how Amiibo was handled. Yeah. And, and I think they probably see this as like, yeah. Now we're able to it's, like it's, make it better. You know, Six years later, but you finally got that Captain Falcon, yeah. Don't be sad. Yeah, yeah, you just got it. It's all we're all cool Don't now, be right? Don't sad, right? Yeah. Um, also, you know, it's another good way for them to just keep Nintendo stuff like top of mind. Like right now, we're talking about you know what kind of they do to kind of keep that interest for Nintendo going. You know, they they obviously have some games coming out and things like that. But what other things can they do to? keep people thinking about Nintendo um, in this transition year. So yeah, Amiibo is really a, an easy way for them to do that um, and releasing these like new runs of, of ones that were pretty limited in the beginning yeah. is a good way to do that as well. It's pretty on autopilot though. It is. Like you don't see them synergizing with like when the, when the WarioWare that everybody's forgotten about right. came out last year. You didn't see Wario Amiibo no, popping up. No, they don't like, care. They don't get that. Yeah crunchy with it. Yeah, they're just Even like they should. release they, it. They probably yeah. should. Yeah, I mean, if they they probably should, um, but they probably don't. <laughs> they probably care. they maybe now they should. <laughs> You're going care. through all the phases here. <laughs> Next question, Ubuntu. Hello. Krista referenced this during the John Cena episode, but I was wondering if either of you were at all involved in the Beyoncé commercial for the Rhythm Heaven game on Nintendo DS. Or the Sprouse Brothers commercial for Pokemon Heart Gold version, Pokemon Soul Silver version games on the Nintendo DS systems. I've always found them funny and charming. Maybe this would be better for a future guest episode, since generally you weren't all super involved in the creation of literal TV advertisements, right? Well, here we are. Well, here we are. Um, I was not involved in like the shooting of the actual commercial. Really? Um, but I do remember working with the advertising team on both of these, where it's like. We are paying these celebrities a lot of money to yeah. make a commercial for, you know, DS. Um, what other things can we do to get the most out of it? So we did, like, press for Beyonce yeah. and, and the Sprouse Brothers. We did, um, like, they, they, I think definitely Beyonce because I think somebody are, actually has this in their possession, someone that we know, the signed DS, the Beyonce signed DS. She signed a the whole bunch. The bedazzled one? There was, no, those were different. She oh. signed one um, that we actually, she signed a few. Some of them we, we had a charity event around, and that really? was one of the auction items for that charity event. Mm -hmm. And then one of them ended up in the garage sale, the, the infamous Nintendo garage sale, which is basically like Antiques Roadshow because uh. you don't know that this is worth a lot of money. Uh, why are you looking I, I, I look, I, We sometimes have that Pokemon clock on yeah. our, on our oh, site. Right we there. don't have it. Yes, that's something we got. A yeah. Very random item that we got yeah. from the garage sale. So someone, someone that we know that I was just at dinner with yesterday told me that this person has recently sold the Beyonce signed DS. You want to guess for how much? So the, the, the person you know had it and sold it. Yes, the person really? that we know. We both really? know this person. Okay, how much? Um... So they, they bought it at the garage sale for three dollars how much do you think they sold the beyonce signed ds for thousand dollars two thousand dollars yeah wow yeah no certificate of authenticity or anything they wrote a certificate of they made one up no no they basically said like i mean? was a former nintendo employee i bought this at an internal company event and then staple their business card to the letter <laughs> Wow. That is a, that is you're authenticating it. Oh, I need more information on this. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? That's great. Isn't this an amazing story? If it was me, I would have held on to it. Of course, Beyonce's you only going to get bigger, going to get more popular. This person has could be ten thousand um, dollars in a couple we, of months. We joke around so much because we all shop those garage sales like little <laughs> ravenous animals, and we joke and we're like, "This is our retirement fund." And this person that we know has wow. been very industrious, and ever since this person has left Nintendo has been slowly selling the items. And I think they are up to like 30K in profit at this point, by the way. Wow! Yep. Oh Some of those items gosh. are worth a pretty, pretty penny. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Our friend uh, Monica, who was on the episode a while back, do you know, did she work on either of these? She did, I think, She yeah. should come back and talk about she these. She can come back and talk about them. The Sprouse Brothers one, I don't remember as clearly as the Beyonce one. The Beyonce one, I remember very clearly because she was terrible at this game. 
kind of a hard game. Terrible. I'm like, the, gi- the gif would lead me to believe otherwise. You're a musician, though. <laughs> You're a musician. The gif that lives on from this would lead me to believe otherwise. I went to the... You're a musician. I went to the shoot for... Dragon Quest IX featuring Seth Green. Oh, Seth Green! Which was interesting. That's weird. And I mean, these shoots, like, it's like a 30 second commercial, but the yeah. shoot takes all day days long. Days and days and days. On a and very, days. on a big set. Like, you wouldn't believe, like, how big the production is. Oh, yeah. For these things. It's a huge deal. Yeah. It's the same thing where. Shot list is so long for them to just tap a screen. Right. It's like, you know, it's we crazy. spend so much money on these celebrities. Let's, let's ring every little bit mm-hmm. out of the can. So we had some people yeah. coming in to do interviews yeah, and yeah. get pictures for social media and all that stuff. So, yeah, that, that's exactly what I, I, why I was there yeah. to get like photos yeah. for. Yeah, right, well, we'll have Monica back and, and talk more about these. Stuff. Yes, it's interesting that era of celebrity commercials, though. For yeah, sure. yeah. Last question is a quickie from Zelgrath about Final Fantasy. How do you feel about single youth single use cushions at Chocobo bus stops? This is a spoiler free question. <laughs> you were very upset by the cushion. I think this sucks. I so, don't care. So to explain. In the open world, you come across these things that look like bus stops. Yes. They're chocobo stops. Yeah. You need to rebuild them. Yes. And when you do, they become fast travel points. Yes. You can rest at a chocobo stop and refresh your HP and MP, but only if you use a cushion. A cushion, which is a lim- like a one-time use item. Mm-hmm. Which you kind of don't see that often. No, that's not true at all. It's not? This is why you have a problem and I don't. I've never used one of these. Oh, okay. I, I've used, I use them every single time. But you can transmute as many as you want. Uh, I don't like that, that system. I really <clears throat> like that system. So it's, Like a Dragon has really spoiled me because in that game, you spend MP to do moves. But if you would do a normal attack, you replenish a bit of that MP. Mm-hmm. So you never have that angst of like, I'm going to run out of MP. Yeah. And I'm going to have to you know, burn all these turns using these items. Yeah. I'm going to run out of items. You can also this. easily eat somewhere Oh my too. gosh, what am I going to do? Yes. Yeah. Whereas this game wants you to use MP to level up your materia, mm-hmm. to level up your magic. Spells and stuff, yeah. But if you're out in the field... The only way you can replenish your MP is to burn an item to rest. Or you can go to like a stable, like a chocobo or you, stable. Or you can fast travel like back to a town or yeah. somewhere else. Like they don't make it very easy like in the moment to replenish that. So I feel like that system, the loop of that system is a little, it's, a, it's got some friction to it. I don't know. I don't feel that way really because I use that item transmitter so much. I have so many potions, so many MP replenishment things, so many cushions. Like, I just, because you're easily able to get the material from it when you're just, like, running around. You don't, you probably have collected a lot of the stuff that you haven't even just used. It's just probably sitting in your inventory. More to come in the spoiler cast on oh, that, on my feelings on that. It's fine, but okay. That's all the questions. That's it. Yes. All right, should we shout out some wonderful Patreon community members? Let's starting do it. with our, our very benevolent final boss. There he is. Aaron Hash. There he is. Yay! He's the best. He's the best boss ever. We're about to send him his monthly surprise package. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We got some he, good stuff. He really liked his last month's surprise package a lot. I don't so blame him. I it's had, cool stuff in I there. I got top it this time, though. Every month it's going to get more extravagant. That's right. Here it goes. Yeah. Very, very cool. Um, and now we have to shout out our wonderful superstars. Are you ready? I am. Ben Icorn. Mara Mayhem. Eichenverse. Kiss My Flapjack. Mike Chin. Roy Eschke. Switching it up underscore. Safazon. VGM Life. Link, the Hero of Winds. Angela Bycroft and her pig Molly. Thomas O'Rourke. Kyle LaBeouf. Roberta Nieves. Frederick Wolf Conradson. Andrew Duhas. Chili. Bruce Stash. And Simon. Wow. Um, are you ready for the One Up Club? Let's go. A Ron Burgundy. Ale Alejandro. Archimedes. Astro Dev. Awesome 46. Bad Moon Horizon. Ben GB. Bookum Dano. Bookish, bookishly Fab. Brad SF56. Brooke Obscura. Brovac Nova. Cameron. Chadir. Shelly Squirrel. Chris Q. Christopher Lay. Captain Alex. Crim Cat. Cristobal. Sea Roper 17. Doxon. Doinko. Elite Peach. S Farts 50. Fart Priest 69. Furbound. Fernie and Just Forever. Fox the Ploy. Garrett Hullfish. Garth the Wolf. Gartooth. 
Heroic. Iris Marin. Jay Rando. Jeffrey Hernandez. Jeremy, Her Jeremy Lewis. Jerry 92602. Jesse Hernandez. John Responte. Jonathan Rowe. Jordan Collette. Jordan Hemmerly. Joshua Clements. Gigi Fruit. Justin Leminger. Kawa 2796. Keith Kwan. Kevin Delane. Kilo Kiba. Krista Roddy Elf. Christopia Party With Me. Kyle Gamer Barry Rookie. Kyle Kretzer. Lazy Cat for Coffee. You forgot Linnell Stickman. Oh my god, I'm so uh. sorry, Linnell Stickman. <sighs> Not cool. Lex. Oh, okay, I see. Lit. Macho Potato. Mad Dog. Five nine eighty one. Magnificent Easy G and Callie Marie. Marky Man sixty four. Mario Man three nine two. Mecha Dragon one hundred one. Medallion. Megan. Michael Craven. Mike. Mr. Ryan O seven. Motomania. Mr. Andy Pong. Mr. Beans and Dip. MSM Poke Gamer. My Tran. Nasir. Nathan Burkhart. Nick. Ninja eleven. Panda Bun. Pangy. Halsey Pace. Paul Gale Network. Prime Factor. Prince Charmless. Reaver. Rain Tech. Record Rumble. Rob Osborne. Rocks. Ryanetta. Sakura Sky. Sharif Jackson. Shinryu. Schmeagol. Slowbro. Schnozzle. Spicy Munchkin. Steel Citrone. Stevie Meeks. Tales of Link. Tay 120N64. The Shark Among Men. Thomas Alvarez. Three Rivers. Timmy V. Tover Schmofer. Totally Joe Ed. Travis Torline. Trajawi. Tugs. Puppy Bear. Tuscoob. Tyler Geist. Video Game Stupid. Vig Mixter. Viridian. Virtual Bot. Weeb Kingdom. WG Grizzy. What up, Khalil? Why you, why you? Wicked Davy. Will Johnson. Zudiver. Zada. Zelgra. The Patty. And Zroid. Oh my gosh. You've escaped why you, why you once more. Mm hmm. Once more. Well, the top. We're talking about your shirt on backwards. Mm -hmm. This is going to be one of those episodes, and I think it was mm -hmm. for you. Oh, boy. For a certain someone no, sitting in my lap. It was a little bit confusing today. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> wow. I don't know what happened. Anyways, um, if you would like to join our wonderful Patreon community, you can find us at patreon.com slash Kit and Krista. Our community is the best. They are literally what is keeping this podcast and everything that we do on this channel going. So thank you so much. We love you and we appreciate your support. So true. If you're watching on video, you can go ahead and subscribe to this channel. Give this video a thumbs up and leave us a comment. And if you're listening on audio, you can also subscribe. Give us a five-star rating and a written review, if you please. And we're on the socials. We're on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, and Threads. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to leave now. Signing off. Bye. Bye.